All members of the committee should have their video on, but will remain muted until the chairman invites them to speak. All members of the press and public will remain muted unless they have registered to speak, and the chairman will let them know when they can make their representation. The format of the meeting will be as per the agenda published, and a copy of the officer presentations can be found on committee website. Thank you very much. Can I also uh, welcome you to the committee? My name is uh, Councillor Filmer. I'm chairman of the Development Committee. Uh, just to run through uh, how we'll be operating today and the format, uh, we have each application before us will be taken in turn. The officers will outline the details of the application, followed by the public speaking time. Members will then debate and decide on the application. For members of the committee wishing to speak, can I please remind you to indicate via the online uh, chat and you will be called in turn to uh, make your comments. During the debate, there will be a proposer and a seconder for a resolution. Members will vote on this proposal in turn, confirming that they've been present throughout the application being considered and will vote for, against or abstain. Votes will then be counted and the result announced. I'll now ask the officers and councillors who will be taking part in the meeting this morning to confirm that they can see and hear me and to introduce themselves. So if we start with the planning officers, uh, Dawn De Vries, are you here? Thank you, um, Chairman. I'm present and correct and can hear and see everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, is Dean Titchener here? Uh, yes, uh, Chairman, I am here and I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Uh, Shanta Parsons. Thank you, Chairman. I can see and hear everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And Amelia Alvey, are you present? Hello, yes. Thank you, Chairman. I'm here and I can see and hear everyone properly. Thank you. Uh, and from our legal team, uh, Dawn Lehman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my name is Dawn Lehman. I'm legal advisor to the committee and I can confirm that I can see and hear everything. Thank you. From our Democratic Services, Leila Nicholson. Good morning, Chairman. Um, I can confirm that I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. And if we then come to the members of the committee, uh, can we start with Councillor Granter? Yes, good morning, Chairman. I, I'm Councillor Graham Granter and I represent the Fairfax Ward here in Bridgewater, and everybody is coming over loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Is Councillor ah. Glassford present? Hello? Hello? Hello. You're through to the Development Committee. Oh, good. Good morning. We'll come back to Councillor Glassford. Uh, Councillor Pearce. Good morning. Um, Councillor Cathy Pearce, Westover Ward, and I confirm I can hear and see everyone. Thank you. Is Councillor Scott present? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Liz Scott from Axvale Ward near Axbridge, and I can confirm I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Somerset District Councillor Alistair Hendry, Burnham on Sea Central. I can see and hear everything. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, is Councillor Glassford with us now? No, still not hearing Councillor Glassford. So, Councillor Murphy. Uh, yes, Chairman. I am here. I can see and hear everybody. Um, I represent the Burnham North Ward. My name is Mike Murphy. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Revens. Uh, good morning, Mr Chairman. Councillor Bill Revens, uh, representing North Pedersen Ward. I can see and hear you all loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yes, good morning, Chairman. Yeah, my name is um, Stuart Kingham. I'm the uh, member for the West Podens, and I can hear and see all. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Good morning, Mr Chairman. Councillor Alan Bradford, representing North Pedersen Ward, and I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bolt. Good morning, Mr Chairman. Brian Bolt, Ward Councillor for Cannington and Wembden. I can uh, see and hear the meeting. Thank you. Councillor Perry. 
Uh, yes, good morning, Chairman. Yeah, I'm Liz Perry, um, councillor for the Kings Isle area, and I can confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Yeah, and, uh, it's Alec. I'm trying to get in. I can't hear anything uh, for the, the meeting yeah. that's, that's taking place. <laughs> Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Tony Grimes, Deputy Chairman, uh, representing Barrow. I can see and hear everybody. Thank you. Right, and and I can see and hear everyone and have heard the responses. It looks like um, we can see and hear Councillor Glassford, but he can't hear us at the moment. So yeah. if we can just bear with for two moments while we try and sort that. There are fleas, isn't it? <laughs> Chairman, can I just confirm yeah. that um, Mr Taylor's on the phone to him? Trying to sort it out. Uh, I'm not actually. <laughs> oh. Hello. Okay. If we, if we carry on just for the moment, we can do the. Um, I think the, the first item on our agenda is apologies for absence. So if we if we start with that while we try and see if we can get uh, Councillor Glassford sorted. But uh, Mrs Nicholson, I'll, do we have any apologies for this morning, please? Thank you, Chairman. I've received apologies from Councillor Facey and Councillor Gibson. Um, I think Councillor Gibson is hoping to join us this afternoon. Excellent. Thank you. And all other members are, are present at the moment. So next item on the agenda, item two, is urgent business. There is no urgent business that is uh, not covered on our agenda today. Item three is public speaking time. For those of you who are members of the public who've registered to speak with us today, um, the format we'll follow will be that we will take uh, the application uh, that the officers will then give us the background and the detail. Uh, once that's happened, we'll then ask you to address the committee. Uh, the process we'll follow is uh, Mrs Nicholson will enable your microphone so that you can then uh, address the committee and you will have three minutes to do so. Um, when you have one minute of that time left to go, you should hear a, a bell. And if Mrs. Nicholson, if you could just uh, demonstrate the bell, please, so that everyone knows what to expect. Thank you. And just to, to remind you, that, that tells you you've got one minute left to go. You've still got time to, uh, to carry on. We have had one or two in the past who thought the bell was the end. So don't. that doesn't mean you've come to the end of your time. That means you've got one minute to go. When you do get to the end of the three minutes, I will then let you know that that is the case and obviously if you come in before the three minutes that will be uh, even better so thank you very much if we move then on to decorations of interest can we just try councillor glassford again please certainly seems can. to be logged in again councillor glassford can you hear us now y yes i can excellent so if you could just confirm who you are and the fact that you can hear and see all that's going on uh, a little bit, right. Uh, Councillor Ali Glasswood, uh, Fairfax Ward, I can hear and I can see. Excellent. Thank you for that, Alex, and well, glad you sorted it. So we move on to the uh, decorations. Uh, I've got uh, Graham Granter, Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, an interest in um, page number seven, Cropal Lane application and also page 15 Victoria Road application as a member of Bridgewater Town Council but I did not attend their planning committee and I haven't discussed the application with anybody at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have Councillor Revens. Good morning Mr Chairman. Um, page 38 the temporary agricultural Workers' Home at Moreland. I'm um, a ward member and member of North Petherton Town Council. However, I took no part in any discussions at the Town Council level. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Just to, to mention that, that that one will be coming up this afternoon. So um, we'll, we'll take that interest again if you can declare that um, in the afternoon session. Okay, I'll, I'll do a repeat performance later. That would be great. Thank you. Um, Count Liz Perry, I've got a declaration. Okay, just hold on a minute, Councillor Perry. I've got a number of others who've indicated in the in the chat yet. So I've got Councillor Bradford next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, number one, personal and prejudicial, my brother. Thank you very much. And I'll wait this afternoon for the others. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor Scott. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll wait until this afternoon. It's regarding one of those. Okay. Councillor Bolt. 
Yes, yeah, same. I was declaring for this afternoon. OK, uh, Councillor Murphy. Um, uh, yes, Chairman, uh, but just to say that uh, although this is not in my ward, um, uh, it was a Burnham application this morning, and I did not take any part in the planning applications for Burnham and St. Castle. OK, thank you. Yes. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, for items on Crow Hill Lane and Victoria Road to declare a personal interest as a member of Bridgewater Town Council, but I've not taken part in any discussion. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Um, yes, so on page, the first one, I'm the ward member, but I took no part in any of the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. And are there any other declarations that anyone's got? doesn't look like it, that's fine. So for, for members of the public, it's important that you know if there's a uh, an interest that members have in an application. So where you've heard a, a, yeah. person, a personal declaration of interest, it means they may have some knowledge, but not to the point that it would actually prejudice their views. Um, they declare it, it's recorded, but they can remain in the meeting, debate the application and vote on it. Where you've heard a prejudicial interest uh, that was declared today, that means that potentially they the, the councillor could be prejudiced by their relationship with a, a close friend, a relative, and therefore they declare that and they will remove themselves from the meeting at the point that that application is dealt with and they will take no part in the debate and they will take no part in the vote. Where you've also heard um, declarations for non-predetermination, that basically means that we have a, a standing order within this committee which says that in order to make sure that members of the public are clear that members come to this meeting with a, a clear and open mind, they shouldn't be involved in um, discussions and decisions at the town or parish council level. So where you've heard members declare that they've taken no part, that means that they have therefore kept themselves able to be involved in this meeting and make those decisions. If they had been involved at that decision making at an earlier stage, then potentially it would be perceived that they may have already made their mind up before they came to this meeting and been predetermined. And therefore, that's why you've heard those declarations today to say that they are, are not predetermined in that, that nature. I would just also mention in terms of attendance to our meeting today, uh, as well as the officers and members that you've heard um, mention that they are here and present, uh, we also have other officers of the council and members, including the portfolio holder for development, who are present in a in a in a capacity to watch the meeting rather than to actually take part in it. Uh, and also, obviously, we've got a number of members of the public, some of whom we've registered to speak, and some are, who are, are just here as as observers. Right, members. If we move then on to the next item, which is the the planning applications themselves. Uh, if we, if we could ask members and members of the public if they wish to turn to page seven of their papers, which is the first application that we have speakers present on. So if, if as I say, you can move to page seven, which is the application at Cropill Lane, Bridgewater. And if I could ask uh, Mr. Titchener, no, if I could ask Miss, <laughs> Miss Parsons, sorry, uh, to introduce this one, uh, that would be, uh, that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can you um, just confirm that you can see my screen with the application open? Not yet, but I'll tell you when it okay. comes up. Sorry. No. Nope. Not yet. Oh, um, did just have an outlook. Shanti, you actually, yeah, are you actually logged on? Um? Well, I was. Outlook stopped working. Does that make any difference? Yeah. Well, we have a problem at the moment. Okay. Shanti, would you like me to present on your behalf? Can you just tell me when to go oh. to the slides? <laughs> um, why would it only be my Outlook, though? Is it not on your desktop? Sorry, let me just, would you mind if I try again? Do I need, um, do I need to keep Outlook open? No. No, no. So did, I don't did know you put, why that did caused Did you put your um, presentation yeah. on, on the uh, desktop? I thought I did. I'll do that again. Try it again. Present desktop. If not, Apologies. Dawn, Dawn Monitor or me to have to do it. Present. It's a good way, isn't it? <laughs> 
I'm hoping that I'm presenting it now. Not as yet. Really don't know why. Do you want to try, Mrs. DeVries, if, if you can present your desktop and see if it's it, it may be a, a system problem as opposed to anything at Shanta's end? But if you if we try that and see what okay. happens. Right, that should be presenting okay. the front screen. Right, we now have got a front screen. Okay. So, so Miss Parsons, oh. if you want to instruct okay. Mrs. DeVries as and when you want to move on to each form. Each okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. So this is um, this is a, a full planning application for the erection of a two-story attached coach house over two existing parking spaces. So if we go to slide one, this will show the location of. That's okay. We're, this will show an aerial with an arrow that shows the location of the site. Yep, we have that. Um, Presently, the site includes two parking spaces and part of the gardens to the east that belong to the flats to the east. Next slide is just a closer view of that site. And slide three shows the application site outlined in red with additional land owned or controlled by the applicant in blue. Um, go on to slide four. This slide shows the consent that was implemented a number of years ago that stands at the site now where we've got the row of uh, terraced houses to the left to the west um, then we have a flat centrally within the within the um, screen with parking underneath for the flats and then to the east is the conversion of the former pub to four flats and where the numbers five, six, seven, and eight are, are um, garden areas to those flats. And the area outlined in blue is the two parking spaces that were allocated to be used as part of that whole development. Go on to slide five, please. And I'm going to, these are some photographs taken from Street View and then some site photos. But because my site photos, the conditions were very gray and rainy, I've included both these and the site photos. That, that shows the area of the parking spaces. Six, slide six. Again, just a closer view, slide seven. Another view. And you can see there the existing building that stands facing you with the garage ground floor clearly um, and then the fencing along the rear boundaries to the flats and then if you have a look at the the rear boundary that's presently there you've got a fence a couple of fence panels vertical fence panels and then a wall which um, also forms part of the neighbors single store extension uh, slide slide eight this is just walk, walking down the road, looking back. So this, this slide is a little bit misleading. It's a street view slide view, and that's why it's stretched a little bit. But that indicates the site. Slide nine, please. And this, these are my photographs facing the site, so you can see, see better the actual context. Slide 10. And 11. This is looking back towards the um, Chiltern Street there, and the tan coloured building is the converted flats. And slide 12. This is just further away looking towards the site and the building to which this proposed building will be attached. Slide 13. And again, so if we go to slide 14, this actually shows the application site outlined in red. It shows a building to be attached to the existing flat there, and it also includes part of the garden area to the flats to the east. And um, the proposal is to erect a one 
person one bed flat above two parking spaces and to provide a parking space to the side. If we go to flat 15, sorry, slide 15. Thank you. Um, so in terms of history of this site, um, sorry, I've missed, missed the history. A previous application was submitted for the erection of um, a coach house above parking spaces. The, the, the issue with that application was that due to the inadequate sizes of the spaces and the fact that the development would have increased the need for parking, it was refused on a uh, lack of parking. The other reason was that it was a contrived, cramped form of development and therefore it was refused because of um, the proposal not being in accordance with design, our design policy. Um, the third reason was that the, due to the height, the length and the form of the building a, adjacent to the existing garden area to the south and the existing flatter development to the east, it would have resulted in um, visual domination and also overlooking issues. The, um, the application was refused for those three reasons. A subsequent application was submitted that was seeking to overcome the previous reasons, but actually there were still issues in terms of um, visual domination to the flats to the east and the garden area to the south. So the applicant has come in to overcome all of those reasons for refusal. And so he, the length of the building has been reduced, the height of the building, is now to stand at, um, let me just check the figures, is now to stand with the eaves height at 3.88 metres and the maximum height of the flat roofed building would be less than 5 metres. Um, the, um, sorry I'm a little bit not running smoothly today, things popping up on my screen because Microsoft's trying to work and it's not. Um, if we go on to slide, fifth, slide 16, please, Dawn. So this is the elevations, as you can see, the height it has been dropped down from the existing building to which it would be attached. Materials would be similar in appearance and the fenestration details would be um, not dissimilar to what is there present. Now, in terms of the principle of the residential development, the site is within um, the residential area within a predominantly built up varying density residential part of the town. So the principle of residential development is considered to be acceptable. Um, in terms of the impact on neighboring properties, can we go back, please, to slide um, 14, please? Got to get things off my screen, they keep popping up. Um, it's like it's going bonkers today, sorry about this. Okay, we're back on. We are back Strange on 14. Chairman, right, can I just you. interrupt one moment? Sorry. Yeah. Um, it looks like our servers are being rebooted at 10 o'clock, so we may have even more of an issue. <laughs> right, right. Get right. this one done quickly. <laughs> no, that's all right. We, 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 if we carry on for this point, and then if, okay. if, if, if it all goes down, we will we'll obviously adjourn the meeting and, and restart once we're back up. But carry on, Ms. Parsons. Oh, right, okay, so um, we talked about the principle of residential development being acceptable in this location. In terms of impact on neighbouring properties, um, it's considered that now with the length of the proposed building being reduced due to the height of the eaves and the ridge, um, the fact that the um, property to the south has uh, a single-storey extension with a high wall forming its boundary is not considered that the proposed extension would result in visual domination and loss of light to the neighbour to the south. Um, in terms of overlooking issues, there are currently windows facing northwards towards the rear gardens of the properties 
in Crope Hill Lane. This application will, of course, include two more windows facing in that direction. They will be at a lower level, um, but due to the distances and other buildings in the rear gardens of the neighbouring properties, it's not considered that there would be any undue overlooking or loss of privacy. The, the proposal does take up half of the garden that is presently provided for the flats to the east. Um, and this, this would provide the proposed property with um, parking space to the side, resulting in three parking spaces provided. Now, in terms of the character of the area, there is a mix of properties uh, with differing garden lengths and sizes and differing plot sizes. Some of the properties don't have any garden, and it's considered that this proposal, in light of the fact that it's for one person, one bed property, um, and that there would be a space provided for this property and a small area for bin storage and, um, for example, um, a small uh, a line wire. The, um, and that the flats to the east still have some outdoor space. It's got not considered that it would have an adverse impact on the amenity of neighbouring properties or the amenity of the existing occupant or the proposed occupant, sorry, of the proposed dwelling. Um, in terms of highway safety, presently there are two spaces that this property would be built over. The, the development would include two usable properly sized parking spaces, and there would also be a parking space to the side. So it's not considered that there would be any undue adverse impact on highway safety due to there not being enough parking. Thank you, Chairman. The recommendation is to grant consent. Thank you very much. The, uh, as members will see, we've got a couple of speakers on this, this application. So if we could ask um, Mick Leary, First of all, who I believe is speaking on behalf of Bridgewater Town Council. Mr. Nicholson, if you could just enable the speaker's microphone. And if, Mick, if you could just confirm that, that you can, uh, that it's working. Uh, yes, sir. I can hear you quite well. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. So just again to remind you, you've got the three minutes. You'll hear the bell ring when there's a minute to go. And obviously, I'll, I'll come in if, and when we get to the three minutes. So start whenever you're ready to go. And Mr. Nicholson will uh, we'll do the timing for you. So start when you're ready. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, members and officers of the Development Committee. Uh, the reasons for objecting to this planning application are as follows. The application is contrary to the local plan regarding policies D2, D13, D14, and D25. Policy D2 refers to the policy of promoting high quality and inclusive design. And in this case, the application is not accessible to all and does not respond positively to the street scene in terms of the local historic uh, uh, cottages, uh, 19th century cottages and council houses. The ground floor, in fact, would be a repetition of garage doors, including the coach house, which is not in keeping with the street scene. The use of the land and appropriate densities does not promote a positive treatment of this particular space. It also takes amenity space away from the flats to the east in, in Chilton Street, and the application and development does not respect the amenity value of, of the occupiers in nearby buildings, and I'm including the coach house there. Um, the application is certainly not convivial to the social interactiveness uh, of what we expect with the building and the residents within it. Policy D13, again, the application does not enhance road or personal safety. The proposed build is far too close to the road junction. The proposed change in the pavement or curb line, which is on your context plan, uh, does, uh, could allow for vehicles aggressing Crowpool Lane at a faster speed because it's been widened. It would also be detrimental to cyclists and pedestrians as well. Now cars parked in the proposed planning open space can be seen quite easily when they are uh, emerging from uh, the area. Uh, this would not be so with cars coming out of garages. The application also allows for three cars to be parked in the area close to the junction 
which is null. And we've got to remember this uh, application as well uh, would be detrimental to cyclists and pedestrians coming up from Homburg Way. Uh, in managing the transport in impacts of policy D14, this development would not provide safe access to roads. The application would be detrimental and would not enhance and develop the rights of way for vehicles egressing and entering Crow Hill Lane. The overdevelopment of this application would generate increased traffic volume and parked cars due to the change in the curb line and the change of use. Finally, policy D25, the living conditions could also be substandard for future uh, tenants and occupants uh, and the roof line has been lowered and there would be a loss of light for neighbours and Mr. residents. Mr. Leary, I'm going to have to call time on you there, but but thank you very much, and and that was that was useful. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a second speaker, which is uh, Lee Vaughan. Uh, again, Mr. Nicholson, if you could enable the speaker's microphone, and if I can ask the speaker just to confirm that it's working. Mr. Chairman, hi. Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. So again, just a reminder: you've got the three minutes in total, and you'll hear the bell go when there's a minute of that time left to go. So start when you're ready, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank the committee also for allowing me to speak in favour of the application at Crowpill Lane. I would also like to thank the planning officer for her comprehensive and balanced report, and I am grateful for her recommendation for approval. As there is little that I would wish to add to the report, I'd like briefly to address the concerns raised by the Town Council in their written response. Street scene. We have endeavoured to ensure that this revised proposal closely follows the existing street scene. The proposed coach house built over garages adjoins a very similar modern two-bedroom coach house also built over garages. In copying some of the design features and most of the build materials, we believe that this proposal very much represents a continuation of that street scene. Highway considerations. The proposed scheme complies with the Council's parking strategy and we would certainly agree that there is no additional detriment to the highway safety over and above the current arrangements. Planning policies. The previous applications 081970 and 169 both face legitimate concerns with regards to local planning policies. We've worked closely with our architect to commit, create an amended proposal which does now comply with those policies as acknowledged within the planning officer's report. Amenity space. It is certainly true that we have reduced the amenity space currently afforded to the two adjacent ground floor flats. These flats have, in our view, previously benefited from an overly large private amenity space. This proposal includes provision of some 23 square, mean, square meters of amenity, which is still 34% greater than the area currently provided to the two first floor flats. We respectfully suggest, therefore, that the residual amenity space is more than adequate for the one bedroom flat that they serve, and it is very much in keeping with similar nearby properties. Substandard accommodation. As the planning officer has already indicated, this proposal conforms with the national space standards for a one-person, one-bedroom coach house. We have always taken great pride in our building projects, as evidenced by our LBC award nomination back in 2008, when we converted the former pub, the Crowfield Inn, and we built the five new additional properties down Crowfield Lane. Should permission be granted today, we would apply the same high standards of construction, which we hope would provide a much needed addition to the local housing stock. I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Uh, right, if we come to members, uh, I've got a number of members who've indicated a wish to speak. I, the first one I have is Councillor Perry, but I'm, I'm going to come to Councillor Glassford first because I think it may be a declaration of interest. Councillor Glassford. Uh, why would it be a declaration of interest, Chairman? Oh, okay. If it's not, that, that's that's my mistake. I'll 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 come to you next, then, Councillor Glassford. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, uh, I was a bit concerned that they have no garden. Uh, these uh, proposed 
flats um, because we've just we're still having a pandemic and everybody um, needs as much garden space as they they can get um, how much sorry I did hear how much garden was going to be taken up um, with this new proposal um, can you just tell me how much of the garden space will be left for the other flats please Ms Parsons do you have that uh, information please Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, if you have a look at the slide, that number 14, um, presently the garden length ranges between three, just under three metres to 3.7 metres, uh, what is shown left for the flats in the former pub, public house. That's right there. Um, basically, it's taking up half of the garden. So previously they were approximately six metres in length, and now they're let their half. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Did you want to ask anything further? No, not at the moment. I'll listen to the rest of the debate. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Glassford. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I went to have a look at this uh, uh, application yesterday, and that, and I actually believe it's uh, it's it's totally contrived. It, it's it's an overdevelopment. It's, it is contrary to the street scene. There is problems with parking down there, and the way the garages are going to be built, it's it's going to be very hard to ac access the garages and get out of them. But uh, I honestly believe that uh, I am totally against this. As I say, it's just a contrived overdevelopment, and I don't think it's safe for uh, traffic either. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a number of other councillors. We have Councillor Hendry, Councillor Pearce and Councillor Kingham. So if we start with Councillor Hendry. Good morning, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you to the uh, case officer for the presentation. Um, firstly, I don't actually see a problem with this in many ways. You can't allow the size of a garden to come into play just because of a thing called COVID-19. That will go away and then you're left with what's there. So that I can't see that being a factor at all. The street scene from this is very acceptable. I, I can't see a problem with that either. I think it all looks pretty good. And once, once the extension is done on there, if it gets done, it's been shortened since the last application. The height of the roof has been lowered. So they're obviously doing everything they possibly can to make this acceptable. It clearly complies with policy D2. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. And as far as policy D25 goes, there is no impact on any house next door to it. There's no overlooking, there's no dominance and no loss of light. I, I wish them well and I hope they do get it. I'm very much in favour of it. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, like Councillor Glassford, went to visit the site um, yesterday. And um, could, could we go back to slide, I think it's slide seven, because I have to say the Google street scene slides where they are stretched give a completely false perspective of the of the street. Um, yeah, that's the one. Well, when I when I visited yesterday, there were two cars in that that spot and they, they took up that entire space. Um, so I too have real concerns that this is contrived over development. I mean, Two weeks ago, we our members were unhappy when a, a, an application in Wendham was 9.8 metres away from its nearest point. We've just been told that the pre, well, the existing, I think it was 3.7 metres space between the um, the current garden space and the it's 3.7, and that's going to be halved to 1.5 metres. And I think that will create overdevelopment and overshadowing for the, those properties along Crow Hill Lane. So I, too, um, would not be in favour of, um, of this development for those reasons. Miss Parsons, did you want to just answer in terms of the size of the gardens? Yes, thank you. Um, President. Presently, the length of the gardens range between 6.3 metres and a little bit longer, and um, minimum length being approximately 6.3 metres. Um, they will be halved, so it's not half from 3 metres to 1.5, it's halved from the 6 metres to 3 metres. Can I, can I come back, Chairman? Yes, Councillor Pearce. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that, because I had misunderstood that, but even so, 
three, three, around three meters is a really tight space to have a building right up close to you. So I, I, I retain my, uh, my objections. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. DeVries, did you wish to come in? Yeah, it, it was just to provide a point of clarification, really, on the plan that's in front of members at the moment, um, so slide 14. So Shant has correctly sort of identified the length of the garden is going to be sort of 3 to 3.7 metres. The separation distance from the end of the garden to the edge of the development in total, because of the car parking space and the pavement, is between 6 and 6.6 .6 metres. Um, I think the other point I wanted to make is one of the slides has actually got the eaves and ridge height on this. So as you'll see, I mean, the photos showed the sort of two story building, um, which I can go back to for members if it would be helpful. The, the design of the property has been set down. So the eaves height is lower than the eaves height of the existing building. And the ridge height is just slightly higher than the eaves height of the existing building. And it's hipped in this direction as well. So um, effectively, there's there's a hip to the front side and back and then a flat roof on the top. So from this section, you'll see the hip and then a flat roof and then a hip again. So all of that reduces the massing of it. And in terms of overall height, I think the eaves height is 3.8 metres in height and the ridge height is 4.9. So in terms of maximum impact, you're looking at, you know, lower than a five metre height. A distance of 6.6 .6 meters um, but it was just to make that clear to members thank you thank you I've got a number of councillors have indicated so I've got councillors Kingham Murphy and Scott so councillor Kingham yeah thank you chairman um, yeah this is um, rather uh, an unusual one really because I see that um, we refused it twice in the past for for a two-story coach house um, obviously, the application applicants have uh, gone a long way, and by reducing the height and the length on this site, they reduced the amount of amenity space on the converted public house, which was granted a little while ago. Obviously, that amenity space was what was granted at the time be, to be sufficient for the conversion of the, the pub. Um, I'm still not. I'm mean, saying the design is fine. I'm quite happy with that, but I'm still not quite sure whether it's it's something, having refused it twice before, that we should be looking at granting permission this time. But um, I reserve my uh, decision on that one until a bit later. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I am in total agreement with <clears throat> Councillor Glassford and Councillor Pierce, I am very concerned about the narrowness of the exit from these garages. In fact, if the cars are parked facing in, it could be at risk, a deep risk coming out. And I think that was probably picked up in previous applications. Um, I also feel that it is, in some respects, unneighbourly. And I think that's something that's brought out protecting residential immunity. They talk about unneighbourliness. It seems to me that it's extremely close to the gardens, <clears throat> and I think there's, there is. Although they've lowered the, uh, they've done very well with their design. I'm, I congratulate them on trying very hard by lowering the ridge line, the, <clears throat> the roof line, to um, trying to stop this visual dominance. But I, I think they fail in some respects because they are. It's in a very tight area. The road is extremely tight outside. I think the risk factor is quite high. And in that case, I would not be in favour of this application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I've got some um, concerns with this as well. I mean, I know it's providing a one-bed accommodation, which is really good news. Um, but I'd just like clarification. There's two garages under the um, flat. Um, are they, um, presumably, if it's a one-bed flat, it only needs one parking space. Um, so I think the provision is for one for the flat and then one for the, the uh, what used to be the pub next door, um, which could cause problems. Um, and also, could you just confirm how many flats are in the pub to the right as we're looking at the, um, the drawing? Um, because as I said previously, that was conditioned to have amenity space and parking 
Um, so I'm not sure we should be giving permission for this at the moment. Thank you. Ms Parsons, can you address those points? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, basically, presently, um, there is a space there for two parking spaces um, that was formed as part of the whole development for the um, five dwellings and the four flats within the former public house. So, um, so that this this proposed building is being built over two existing parking spaces, but it's still providing two parking spaces within a garage form, and they are adequate in size in terms of the uh, county's parking strategy. So they're adequate in in width and length, but the application is also including an additional space to the side. So. Um, we're, what we're looking at here is having a one-person, one-bed flat together with one additional parking space there. So, so in terms of parking, it won't um, take away any parking allowance for the existing properties because those spaces can still be used by um, the existing flats in the area. Does that make sense? The, um, so basically, we're we're building over two spaces but still providing those two spaces and then there will be one more space for the um, one bed flat. Councillor Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, that's what I, I thought. Um, I'm just a bit concerned now that there are actually four flats in the um, old pub <clears throat> and then you're actually reducing the garden space down even more. Is that the case? I can confirm the planning permission was approved for four flats within the pub and um, the only change is that their garden areas will be reduced by this application. So there always was four flats within that pub with limited garden space. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank That's you very much. Thanks. Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of points here. On, there's a point that keeps getting raised here about this thing, garden space. If you take a block of flats anywhere, 12 flats, 16 flats, 18 flats, they don't have any garden space at all, absolutely nothing. So I can't understand what all this thing about garden space is going on. The parking spaces have not been compromised in any way. As I stated earlier when I spoke, the, the building is shorter uh, in length, lower in height than it was before. Policy D25 is not compromised in any way either. There's no overshadowing now because the roofs come down in the length. Uh, I cannot see a problem with this at all. And I would like to move the um, case officer's uh, recommendation for acceptance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, highway safety, that doesn't seem to be a problem. It would appear this is the third time back for planning, I think it is, isn't it? And uh, the planning officers obviously work very, very hard with the developers to come up with some some, some resolution towards making it acceptable for everybody. It's not, it's not an easy one because the length has been reduced, the height's been reduced, and I don't know really what else they can do, actually, to, to appease everyone. Um, it's a difficult application, again, because we get all the difficult ones. We get all, you know, if it's easy, they've been flew through and gone on, no doubt about it. But the difficult ones always come before us. And they always they get an awful lot of debate, and everybody's got an opinion around this table, which is very, very interesting. I think at times it really, really is. And uh, the garden space, there is limited. And Councillor Perry's got a point regarding this, but it might not go on forever. Hopefully not, but you just don't know. And uh, sometimes you've got to... I haven't made my mind up quite, to be honest yet, Mr. Chairman. It's one of them right on the fence. I am right on the fence. But how many more times can it come before planning, before somebody's got to be positive, take the ball by the horns and get on? I think we should be grateful of developers for doing anything in this present climate and what might materialise in the next five to ten years. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeBreeze? <sighs> Um, thank you. It was just going back to a point that um, one of the councillors raised earlier in terms of the fact that we've previously refused it. Um, under the previous schemes, the issue um, or the issues that we were having with it is that the garage spaces that were being provided weren't compliant with county standards. So technically, whilst 
they were still shown they weren't parking spaces. Um, and secondly, there is um, national space standards for living accommodation in terms of immunity of future occupiers. Um, previously, it was for um, a sort of greater scale of accommodation. So the, the amount of amenity space for the future occupiers would have been less. The proposals it's put forward to members at the moment is for a one bed flat for single occupancy. So it's intended to be a one bed flat for one person, in which case the amount of accommodation it provides and the floor space it provides is now compliant with national space standards. We we as a council haven't adopted national space standards um, because it would prescribe a set amount of acceptable floor space and each case has to be assessed on its own merit. But the fact that the floor space provided internally for the one bed unit um, is compliant with national space standards, I would suggest that that would indicate that it wouldn't be an immunity issue for future occupiers in, in accordance with policy D2. Previously, the scale of accommodation proposed was, um, I think, originally for two beds and then taken down to um, a sort of one bed double occupancy um, and it would have been too small for that. So it has been reduced to now comply with space standards um, and the parking spaces have been increased to make sure they're compliant with county standards. I think also um, another issue was that the external, um, the entrance to the first floor accommodation was external which would have conflicted with um, flood guidance so the access to the flat is internal the space standards accommodation for a one bed one person occupancy is now compliant and the ground floor parking spaces is also compliant with county standards so that's the difference between the previous applications that um, were resisted and and how we've come to this point thank you Thank you. I have a couple of councillors who have indicated, Councillor Grimes and Councillor Pearce. So, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I, I've listened to this intently and uh, you can see arguments from both sides. Um, but on balance, I've come down with um, the idea that I'm happy to second Councillor Hendry's proposition. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Well, it's just, just to come back to say, I just believe this is trying to squeeze a, a quart into a pint pot, as they say. And I can't understand why this doesn't continue to be contrived, cramped form of development and not in accordance with design policy and seems to be contrary to policy D25, where it says that development proposals that would result in a lot of land recreation and or amenity valuable or an acceptable impact on the residential amenity of occupants of nearby dwellings will not be um, supported and this seems to do just that to me so uh, that's why I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from members? I'm not seeing anything on the on the chat. So we have had a proposal that's been moved and seconded which is to to grant permission uh, moved, I think, Councillor Hendry, seconded by Councillor Grimes. So I will come round to, to members to ask them for their uh, their votes and to confirm that they've been present throughout the the uh, presentation and debate. So if we start with um, Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I can confirm that I have, I have been present throughout the debate, but I'm uh, even though that um, they've done a lot of work, the officers and everything goes, I still think that it is over development, so I'm against the officers' recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Glassford. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I've, uh, I've heard and uh, seen the present presentation and that, uh, and unfortunately, I don't like going against the officers' recommendation, but I have to this time. I am against. The officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you. I confirm I've seen and heard the whole um, presentation and debate and I am against the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I can confirm I've seen and heard the whole debate. It's a very difficult one, um, but I feel I need to support this because it is a valuable one bed accommodation. Thank you. So you're for the proposition? Yes. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, Councillor Hendry. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman. 
uh, on the fact this this complies with policy D2, D25, it's been shortened and the height has been lowered. Yes, I, I accept and go forward the proposition. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Um, thank, you. <coughs> thank you, Chair. I have uh, seen and heard the whole presentation and I am against the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Revens. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I confirm that I have seen and heard the officer presentation and the debate, and I am against the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've um, listened with intent at this application. I don't think it's been said, and I'm against the application. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. And I've heard the whole debate, Mr. Chairman, and found it very difficult to decision, but I'm for the application. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. I'm present throughout the whole application and debate uh, against. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I was uh, heard um, everything through the whole debate and I am against. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and uh, heard the presentation and on balance I'm for. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise, I've seen and heard the presentation uh, and on balance them and for the recommendation to grant. So I think that's all members who are present. Uh, Mrs. Nicholson, if you could just confirm the vote, please. Thank you, Chairman. I've got five in support of the, of the recommendation and eight against. So that is, is clearly lost. So I am looking for a member to make an alternative proposal with planning reasons for that, please. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would say the, the reasons to refuse are because the proposal is con a contrived, cramped form of development, not in accordance with design policy and contrary to policy B25. Councillor Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to uh, second Councillor Pierce's proposal. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. De Vries, just to come back to you, if I can, to just confirm that you're happy that those are, are valid reasons. Um, apologies. Can I hear the reason for refusal again? <laughs> all, all the concerns. No problem, Councillor Pierce. Um, yeah, that it's contrived, cramped form of development, not in accordance with design policy and contrary to policy D25. Um, if we're adding D2 to that, because D2 is the design policy, D25 is impact on amenities of residents. So is, is the concern both design in terms of cramped and contrived in terms of street scene and impact on the amenities? And if so, which property and what amenities? Um, yes, it is including D2 uh, for the design and it is, um, well, for the proposal, the proposal will be cramped, a cramped, cramped form of development, the, the application itself. Okay, so it's amenities of the future occupier. Yes, yes, sorry, yeah, thank you. Okay, and happy with that, Mrs DeBruz? You're, you're clear that you've got the reason? Yeah, we, we will draft something to reflect that and agree and, with and Ms. Parson. Councillor and Councillor Grimes. Um, thank you, Chairman. I feel that we need to say exactly due to what what issue the proposal will be um, unacceptable and what amenity we will be impacting on and how the design is unacceptable, just so that I can actually draft a, a refusal reason. Okay, so so in terms of design, I, I, I presume it's a relationship with the neighbouring properties is the issue of design that it's, is the concern? Correct. Okay, and in terms of the amenity side, it's the... It's the neighbouring property, the amenity of the neighbouring property. So that, and I'm sorry, I haven't got the number in front of me of the, the, the property of the flats on the... On the um, so that's Chilton the former Street. pub. Yes, yes, that's yeah. it. Thanks. Okay. 7.211, Mr. Chairman. 7.211. Do you want to just clarify what you mean by 7.211? I'm sorry, I'm being dense. P 
page 156 of D25, 7.211. Ah. Okay, Protect thank you very much. Potential immunity. Fair, thank you. Right, I think members are clear then as to what the proposal is, and we can we can work the uh, work, make sure we've got the Mrs. De Vries you've indicated. I'm I'm really sorry. Um, the the immunity impact is is it both the immunity impact of the the future occupier of the unit? So we're looking at the internal size of of the unit plus immunity impact on the um, pub conversion because of the reduction of the gardens correct okay and then in terms of the design I'm assuming from the discussion that I've heard it's because of the size and proximity to the boundary in terms of appearing over dominant on the boundaries to the neighboring properties in terms of design or, or are we also concerned that the design itself is in keep out of keeping with the street scene sorry to push I'm, I'm just trying to clarify what the reason for refusal is i think again just for members it's not a question of being pedantic it's just a question of if if we were to have to defend this decision obviously officers having made one recommendation we have to be very clear as to what what the grounds are that we're defending should we should we need to but uh, councillor pierce shall, shall i shall i come back the, the the main overriding reason for my um refusal of this is the fact that it's i believe it is a cramped form of development so whether we leave the design element out of it at this stage because i think that is a weaker a weaker element to this it's about the uh the, the protecting the residential amenity as we said for both the residents of the flats in chiltern street plus the future residents of this particular property um and the overdevelopment of that site. Ms. Dridge, you're clear on that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, and Mr. Councillor Evans, you're happy with, with that as the seconder? Yes, I'm happy with, with that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I've got Mrs. Lehman, did you want to comment? Thank you, Chairman. No, I was just going to um, ask that the seconder was um, happy with the refusal reasons ah. and he seconded it on that basis. Thank you. Okay, that's clear. Right, members, then you've heard the, the recommendation now for uh, refusal on the grounds as outlined by Councillor Pearce. Uh, we'll start again this time with, with Councillor Granter. You, you've heard the, uh, the recommendation. I'm looking for your your vote, and I guess we need to confirm that you've heard the whole of the discussion as well, please. Yes, I, I can confirm that I've heard the old, old discussion, and um, I'm in favour of um, the resolution. Thank you very much. Councillor Glassford? Yes, thank you, Chair. I've heard the whole debate. I am in favour of uh, Councillor Pearce's resolution. Thank you. Councillor Pearce? Thank you, Chairman. I've heard um, the whole debate and I am in favour of the refusal. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've heard the whole debate and I'm actually in favour of this refusal. Thank you. C Councillor Hendry. I've heard everything, uh, Mr Chairman, seen everything and uh, I can't remember what you're supposed to do. Is it against the... Um, no, so, I, I mean, yeah, go on. Well, the, the resolution now is for refusal. So it's if, if you are f if you're for refusing it, then it's for, and if if, if you're against refusing it, it would be against. I'm on, I'm against. Okay, against. Thank you for that. No problem at all. It's it's a double negative. It gets it does get a bit uh, confusing. So, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chairman. My apologies. I have seen and heard the whole presentation, and I am for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Revens. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Uh, yeah, I confirm I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm in favour of Councillor Pierce's proposal. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've um, been listening and watched the whole debate, and I'm a for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. I've heard the whole debate, Mr Chairman. I'm against refusal. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. I've heard the whole debate and for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, I've heard the whole debate and I'm for refusal. 
Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the debate and I'm against. Thank you. And likewise, I've heard and the whole debate and I'm also against the recommendation of refusal. So again, I think that's all councillors covered. Mrs Nicholson, if you could just confirm the numbers, please. Thank you, Chairman. I have nine in support of a refusal and four against. That's terrific. Thank you very much. That is therefore carried. So permission is refused for the outlined reasons uh, from from uh, that the members had before them. So that is that is refused. Right, members. Uh, if we can then move to our next application, which is back to page one, please. And we move to Bordrip, and this time, Mr. Titchener, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, so, uh, just obviously, there's usually a bit of a lag with the presentation just showing up. So, I'll just wait for that to catch up. Maybe if you could just let me know uh, if it's visible. We do have the front cover. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so it's an application for the erection of a general purpose agricultural building for the storage of fodder. It's located at Peasy Farm uh, at Bradney Lane in Bordrip. Just wait for it to click through. Bear with me. This it was quite slow clicking through when I presented the previous committee. So that's okay. If, if you bear with us one minute, and I think I've got Mrs. Lehman. You wanted to comment on. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, can I just confirm that Councillor Bradford has left the meeting, please? Yes, he has. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we still appear to be on the front cover page at the yeah. moment. Uh, and I am still at this end. Uh, uh, oh, oh, it's clicked. Right. We now have a, an, a, an aerial, aerial, an aerial okay. photograph. Uh, okay, so this is just highlighting where the site is. This is Peasy Farm here, just to the sort of southwest of Bordrip. Obviously, we're not too far from the edge of uh, from Bridgewater here, and not too far away. And uh, this is the application site. So this is all the existing farm, large number of existing agricultural buildings, uh, two accesses um, off of uh, off of Bradney Lane, um, and other notable features nearby: King Sedgemoor Drain, not far by. An, um, uh, an environment agency depot which runs along uh, the bottom end of the site and the buildings to be located approximately here uh, and you can see within the red line where the additional agricultural building is to be located and its access coming in here. Uh, just in a bit more detail, just close up, just showing where the building is going to go uh, and uh, details of uh, surface water holding tank that's proposed. Um, and uh, so you can see there. In terms of its design, it's a fairly standard agricultural building, uh, modern um, profile sheeting, open at one elevation, um, uh, so green box profile tin, grey fibre cement uh, roof. I have to say that's a fairly standard design um, for modern, build, modern agricultural buildings. Uh, uh, and the floor plan, just showing it open on one elevation and contained on the others. And just to orient, uh, get some views of the site. So the site is on a sort of is on a small rise because a lot of the uh, land around is uh, um, fairly flat. This is looking in from the access track towards the existing complex and the buildings to be located over here. Again, moving up the access track into the site, you can see some of the existing buildings against which the backdrop against of which it would be located. You know, and these are already modern farming and agricultural buildings on the site. And again, another angle looking in towards um, uh, and the building would be set in close proximity to what we already have on the site. And again, from the west, this is sort of looking from the other side, from, from the roadside. So you can see there's this sort of slight rise of the hill on which quite a bit of the farm is set. So the farmhouse itself is quite prominent when you come from the Bridgewater end. But it's to be located on the far side of these, on the far side of some of these agricultural buildings. So there won't be any particular impact from, from this uh, viewpoint. And then just in terms of looking at the principle, so it's 
it's a countryside location where policies uh, can be uh, restrictive, but that does allow for agricultural development. Now, this is a large farm, as you can see from the number of buildings located there. So they farm about 471 acres. It's a uh, number of elements to the operation. So there's a beef suckler herd. They do calf rearing up to 24 months. They've also got quite an arable operation. Uh, so they grow maize, winter wheat, spring barley. So um, quite diverse. The proposal is to allow um, the storage of straw under cover during winter months as part of a, a proposal to expand the nature of their operations further. Um, it's obviously a very large site. Um, we believe it's an appropriate justification to enable this um, you know, established existing business you know, to, to continue to grow uh, further. In terms of visual impact, as I've mentioned, and as is obvious from the photographs and the plans, there's a large number of existing agricultural buildings on the site, and the proposal is to be grouped with the others, so it will be seen against those as a backdrop. Um, it's a fairly standard design for a modern agricultural building, so we consider that broadly, um, you know, it is a it's going to be respectful of the character of the area and not in any way visually harmful. In terms of other matters. There's no other nearby property, so we don't consider any amenity issues would arise. In terms of flood risk, uh, as I've mentioned, a lot of the land around the site is, flood, is, is quite low, and some of that is flood zone three. Part of the site is elevated uh, um, because of the hill, and that's flood zone one. This building sort of straddles, straddles over part of the boundary. But the advice, the standing advice we have from the Environment Agency is for agricultural development it uh, is okay in such locations uh, anyway. There's no um, presumption against agricultural buildings per se in flood zone three, and this building is part one, uh, part zone one, and part zone three. Um, but there is a drainage condition uh, to be attached in terms of surface water, uh, just to make sure that there's uh, no additional runoff created uh, that can be uh, adequately controlled. And I do have just a couple of updates, just because um, the consultation period hadn't uh, completely finished at the point that, that the re uh, committee report was finalised. So um, just one, uh, one particular one to note was an objection from the Rights of, of Way team at the County Council uh, about the impact on a footpath which runs through the site. So there is... Just bear with me. Uh, so there is there is a footpath isn't shown on here, but it was coming through and uh, just clipping this bottom corner of the building slightly. So the um, rights of way team said uh, asked for the building to be relocated um, or repositioned slightly, and you can just see here that the um, uh, the building is now just pushed slightly further to the north, just to avoid clipping the corner of that um, of the right of way. Um, we've checked that out with the rights of way team. They're happy with the revised siting and have no objections. Um, we would, uh, because of that, there's potential for works to impact on the right of way, just attach a standard informative, um, just reminding the applicant of their um, responsibilities in terms of uh, uh, works near a right of way. But there's no objection in terms of. Uh, that there is any further impact on the right of way, so that's not considered to be an issue. But we would need to update the plans list to include the Rev C plans shown uh, here, rather than those that were set out in the uh, in the committee report. Just a couple of other updates that were comments have also come in. The Paris Council wrote in just to say they had no comments on the application, and similarly, Environmental Health had written in. Um, after the committee report was uh, prepared, and they also have no comments on the application. Uh, so the recommendation in this case is to uh, grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you'll see, we have no speakers on on this. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Lehman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was just the point that um, um, the planning officer uh, referred to the revised plan um, in relation to the footpath. So members will need to note that the revised plan will be part of the planning permission when they move for recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no speakers, as I say, on this application, so I'll come to members for comments and questions. I first of all have Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, Obviously, apart from the fact that this um, application is a relative of councillor, I mean, so yeah, I think normally it would have probably have gone through without coming to committee. So 
with the conditions that the uh, footpath has been allowed to pass the building, I have no um, problem in um, recommending a grant permission. Thank you. So that's a, a grant permission with the updated conditions and updated map. That's uh, correct, Chairman. The plan references. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Bolt, I have next. Yeah, just second that one. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from members? I think Councillor Scott may be wanting to comment or not. Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I was going to second it because I think, uh, as already said, this was gone through with no problem. Thank you. OK, thank you. I'm not seeing any other members indicate that they wish to comment. So we have had the recommendation moved and seconded to grant permission with the updated uh, conditions and plans as, as outlined by Mr Tipner. So we'll start uh, this time with uh, Councillor Murphy. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I am for. Thank you. Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the presentation and I am in favour of the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, having uh, listened to the short presentation and uh, I'm in favour of the uh, recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Oh, sorry. Councillor yes. Bradford out of the room. Councillor Bolt. Yes, um, a bit present for the whole application and for... Thank you very much. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. I've seen and heard all the presentation and I'm for for the development. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. I've uh, seen and heard the recommendation and I'm for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Granter. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard all the, the application and I am for the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Glassford. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the presentation I for the officer's recommendation. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Yep, I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I am for the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the officer's presentation and I'm for the application. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard everything and I am 100% in favour for. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise, I've heard the presentation and discussion uh, and I'm also f in favour of the recommendation. Mr Nichols, I think that's everybody. Could you just confirm? Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, that's uh, unanimous and that's 12. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, I'm going to suggest that we take a, a short comfort break at that point. So we will restart at, at 5.2. That's about six minutes time. So that will be a, about 5 to 11. So we'll short comfort break. Meeting adjourned until then. Yeah, present. Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Present, Chairman. Councillor Pearce. Yep, present, Chairman. Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Present. Councillor Hendry. Yes, I'm here, Mr Chairman. Can see you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Yes, present, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Revens. Present, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yeah, present, Chairman. Is Councillor Bradford here yet? I'm here, Mr. Chairman. What about? Oh, it's gone wrong. Good. No, no, that's fine. We we thought we'd lost you. What happened? Have you gone off off screen for a while? Or what? I we had a much. we had a short comfort break, Councillor Bradford. Right. So, Councillor Bolt. Yes, I'm back. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Yes, present. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Grimes. Yes, present, Chairman. Yep, and obviously uh, I'm present as well and can hear members. So if we move on then to our next application, which is on page 15 of the report, uh, we are in Bridgewater and it's uh, Amelia Elve. Would you like to uh, present this one then, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Hello, everybody. Can you all see my um, presentation? Not yet, but okay. hold on. It, it is now up on the screen. Right. OK, I will make a start then. 
So this is a full planning application at 33 Victoria Road for the erection of a single storey extension and first floor extension to the rear west elevation and conversion of loft to living accommodation. The main policies to consider for this application are D2, D14 and D25. So that's the visual amenity, residential amenity and highway safety. Here circled in yellow, you can see the application site. It is sited to the southwest of Victoria Road and Bridgewater. The dwelling is a mid terrace property with red brick to the front and render to the rear. The property is currently served by a single storey rear extension and a parking area sited at the end of the garden. The application seeks consent for the erection of a part single storey, part two storey rear extension. The single storey flat roof element of the scheme will project approximately 7.3 metres from the rear of the dwelling and the two storey element of the scheme will be finished with a hipped roof and project approximately 5 metres from the rear of the dwelling. At the top we have shown the existing elevations with the proposed elevation shown below. The proposed extension will be finished in render to match the existing dwelling and the ridge height of the two storey element will be set at the eaves height of the main dwelling. Here we have the existing floor plans and the proposed floor plans. So the extension will accommodate a utility room and a larger kitchen at the ground floor and a third bedroom with an ensuite at first floor. The development will also result in the conversion of a loft to living accommodation. However, this is considered to fall within permitted development rights. So here are some uh, of my photos from my site visit. So this is as you approach the rear of the site from Coronation Road. Due to the visibility of the rear of the dwelling and the neighbouring properties, the impact on this street scene has to be considered. So they, as you can see, there are other similar extensions to neighbouring properties in the vicinity. So there has been a slight mistake in the report. In the report, it said that it was a three bedroom remain property remaining to be a three bedroom property. But in fact, the existing property only has two bedrooms and is becoming a three bedroom property. However, the report has still made an assessment on the parking needs of a three bedroom property. The parking area can be seen in the top photograph and is considered appropriate for the parking of two vehicles. And the extension of number 37 here is shown in this photograph and it's considered to be a similar projection to what's being proposed here. So here again is a clearer view of the neighbouring property which will be similar to the proposal. So the proposed extension will use matching materials, will use a hipped roof which is considered to be in keeping with similar extensions in the vicinity and is overall considered to be appropriate size, scale and design. There's also considered to be adequate off-road parking provision. The first floor projects approximately five metres from the rear of the dwelling which is similar to the neighbouring extension as shown in the photographs. Conditions will be um, added to any consent issue to prevent any windows installed to the side elevations at first floor at level to prevent any overlooking. The ridge and eaves height is lower than the main dwelling and the white rendered finish is considered to assist with light refraction and therefore the officer recommendation is to grant planning permission. Thank you very much. Okay. Members, any comments or questions please? Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. A um, little bit very similar to um, an application I think we had last time, but not quite so um, overpowering. Um, and you see the, the rear of existing properties very much in keeping with what is already there. Um, I did notice from the, the Town Council they object from loss of light overshadowing of neighbours. But as there's already this precedent set in the street, then I actually have no problem with this application. And I'd like to um, propose a recommendation. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillors Bolt, Hendry and Glassford. So, uh, Councillor Bolt. Uh, thank you. Uh, could we go back to slide seven? That was the, the exact slide I was going to ask for. Is the two-storey extension going the full width, did it say? No, the two-storey extension is just going to be um, half the width. If I just show you the, um, yeah. the drawing, then that will help. 
So as you can see, it's just this width with the oh, single right. story Got being you. that width of the width. Any further comments or questions, Councillor Bolt? If not, I'll move on to then Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This extension seems to fall in line with all the other ones uh, in that row, so it wouldn't look out of place. Looks exactly the same almost as every other, so yes, they should have this. And I'm happy to second Councillor Stuart Kingham. Thank you for that. Thank you. I've then got Councillor Glassford and Councillor Scott. So, Councillor Glassford. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, I did go and have a look at this yesterday and that, and uh, I can see no problems with it at all, considering that. Uh, properties around that have similar uh, uh, extensions to them. So I, can, I will support this application. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Yes, I agree. Um, I'd like to, uh, sorry. Um, yes, I agree. I'd like to support this application because it looks like it would tidy it up and um, it would in, you know, in keeping with the street scene. Thank you. Thank you very much. If are there any other further comments from members? I'm not seeing anyone indicating. So we have a recommendation that's been moved and seconded to uh, go with the officer's recommendation to grant permission. Uh, if we start this time with members uh, to take their votes and confirm they've been present, uh, we'll start with Councillor Murphy this time, please. Thank you. Um, I've seen and heard the whole application and I'm voting in for, in favour of the application. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, yeah, I've confirmed I've seen and heard the presentation and debate, and I'll be voting in favour. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've been present and heard the whole debate, and I'm in favour of the application. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've heard the whole debate, and I'm in favour of the application. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. I've heard the application and debate in favour. Four. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I've been present and heard all the debate, and I am for. For it. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've seen and heard the presentation, and I'm for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've heard and seen the all of the application and I'm in favour. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the presentation. I am in favour of the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you. Yep, I've seen and heard the whole of the presentation and I'm in favour of the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, I've seen and heard the whole um, presentation and I'm in favour of the officer's recommendation. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard everything and I'm very much in favour of this. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and likewise, I've seen and heard the presentation and discussion and I'm also in support and in for. Uh, so, Mrs Nicholson, I think that's all members. Could you just confirm the vote? Thank you, Chairman. That's unanimous. So that's 13 in support. Thank you very much. So that is clearly carried. So permission is is granted. If we then, members, could move to the next application we have this morning to uh, Burnham. And Miss Parsons, I think you're introducing this. If I could just ask before we do that, though, could we just confirm, is, is Councillor Bradford's camera working OK? When when he came up on the screen, he only came up as a, an icon. You're right. I'm a, I am an icon. Uh, it, it, it come out. It's just not right at all. Okay, They've got a statue. They're going to pull me down next week. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. It's good, good to see you back. It was better the other week. <laughs> right, members, uh, as I say, to page 22 and Miss Parsons, if you'd like to introduce this one, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Dawn DeVries is presenting this for me because I still can't uh, arrange to do it. I'm not sure why, and I do apologise for that. This is a planning application for the erection of a garage. The site is located um, within the built-up residential area of Burnham. It is on the corner of Levine Close, which is a close of a number of detached properties. Um, Opposite the site is the public house, 
on the other side of Love Lane and also is the Tesco store further to the south just so that members can get the bearings. Um, to the west, immediately to the west is a bungalow. I'm going to slide two, just shows a closer view of the site. It's currently used as a garden area and is fenced off, and we'll have a look at the photographs in a minute. Uh, the proposal is to erect a detached garage. Um, in, terms of print, in terms of the history of the site, there was a planning application submitted and refused that was for the erection of a dwelling on this land. Um, it was then submitted again and refused and dismissed at appeal. The reasons for refusal was that the site wasn't adequate in size to satisfactorily accommodate a dwelling with parking, garden and turning. That would be in keeping with the character of the area. Um, so if we go on to the photographs, the next slides, please. Sorry, you can stop here. Slide number three sorry, shows the proposed um, garage on the site with the access towards the north with the garage door there. The garage itself would measure um, 8.4 8 metres at it, its length and 4.82 metres at its widest point. The, the, um, it, that would clearly accommodate um, be more than enough for a single garage, not quite the standards for a double garage. A double garage would be six meters by six meters, so it's slightly short of a double garage. So going on to the photographs, if we go to slide four, so that is looking across the road straight into the corner of the site. Um, presently, there is that gray shed on the site, and it's currently fenced all around the front and the side. And going on to the next slide, this is looking back at the site itself. As you can see, it's a fenced, grassed area with a shed down towards Love Lane. The next slide, looking straight into it from the north, and this would be where the access into the garage would be. So if we go on to the next slide, it shows slide seven shows the proposed elevations of the building. As you can see, it got standard garage door on the north elevation and windows on the other elevations. The door, the elevation with the door faces west, and that would be the elevation facing the adjacent bungalow. In terms of um, history, as I said, the previous applications that were submitted on the site were um, refused, but that was actually for a dwelling on the site. The design of this garage includes a um, standard garage door with windows. And whilst it is not um, generally considered of um, standard simple design garage, it would not look out of place in, the in terms of the character of the area when you take into consideration the neighboring properties around. It's of adequate size to accommodate parking. The access into the site is satisfactory. and um, in terms of highway safety, there there has been an issue raised by the highway authority, but that's been clarified. Um, there is a strip of grass verge alongside the existing fence line of the garden area, and the highways authority um, claim that that is a wider strip and that it is under their control. Um, we've had sight of title deeds that indicate that actually that strip is quite narrow, and it is as shown on the photographs and on the drawing. So we are satisfied that the proposal does not encroach on highway land, and the recommendation is to grant consent. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, do we have any um, details of what the construction of the garage would be? Because it looks rather um, a grand for a garage with a number of windows in it. It's just been a bit sceptical, that's all. But um, is it just a single block wall or is it a cavity wall? Do we know anything? Miss Parsons? Thank you, Chairman. We don't have that detail. The detail that's shown, hopefully you can see that slide now, which I can see, so you will be able to um, know that's the detail that we have. That's why I've just been a bit sceptical, that's all. 
Understood. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And I think whatever happened, it would look better in this weave of fencing everywhere. It looks, looks awful, to be perfect, honestly. Um, we did say something about this, several sort of months, but it's too late now for application of a bit of happened, but there's more and more of this coming about. And, and we're in a, a time when the environment is important, and sometimes you need to look at planting trees or bushes rather than these fences. They do look, in particular in North Pethen, there's several places quite dominant with some of this stuff, and it doesn't look the best of. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Miss Parsons, do you want to just confirm the, about the boundary treatments? Yes. Um, presently, there is a, a fence that runs along here, um, which you would have seen in the photographs. Oh, so I'm 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 trying to show you, but I'm thinking I can't. But Dawn is now indicating where the fence line is going, and um, with a proposed garage there, that fence line will be um, only up to the building itself. Um, so I'm I'm not entirely sure what what the um, question was in terms of the fence, but part of that will be removed. The garage will be in its place. It's considered that in terms of the design of the garage, um, it would be rendered. It would have um, hipped and um, ridged roofs, and it would be in keeping with the character of of the other buildings in the area. Thank you very much. I've got councillors Murphy, Hendry, and Grimes. So, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have to say that uh, I'm concerned about this building because it, it's it's not just a garage. It looks like a two-story building. Um, admittedly, it's uh, it's quite high for a garage, and it's twenty. It's 26 or something feet, 20, let me see, 26 feet long. It's quite a long garage. Um, if they were just wanting a garage for their house, it, it, 26 feet seems a long thing to apply for, especially with quite a high-pitched roof, which possibly could accommodate a sort of an office. It looks like a mini house. I, I, I am concerned. And looking at the objection from the town council, I intend to agree with them. Uh, I am not sure about the access and swept path analysis, which, but it seems to be unclear because it's right on a corner. Um, and it would be an ore development of the site. Certainly, it's as they say, the words they use, certainly disproportionate in size for use as a garage. Um, it doesn't. It's not in keeping with the area in terms of a garage. It's more like in keeping with the area in terms of a mini house. So this, to me, it's it's a uh, it's it's a Trojan horse. It's something that's in in disguise. I don't know what the game is here. Uh, excuse my French, my my language. I don't know what the aim is. Not the game. Um, the uh, I just feel there's something. I'm 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 very skeptical about it. I I, I can't see it. Just, it's not just a garage. It's a multi-use building, and I think in that case, it would be um, overdevelopment. And I would object to that, especially on that corner. It's a very tight corner with a small copse of houses. Um, I would have thought the gar I'm surprised that the garden was allowed to be fenced, uh, or the grass area, because it was. I think it was intended as an amenity area, uh, in keeping with the with the development of the houses. Um, and so I think a double, uh, not a double, but could it be a one and a half? What is the height of the garage? Do we know? May I ask the planning yeah. officer? What is the height of the garage? Ms. Parsons, do you want to address those issues? Yeah, yes, at, thank you, Chairman. Showing it? I'm sorry, Ms. Parsons, could we look at the slide showing it again? Yes. What is the height, the roof height? The, the height is 5.52 metres. The length of the garage is 8.4 metres, and the width yes. is 4.82 metres. The um, standard generally required length of a garage under the parking standards would be six metres, and so it's two metres longer uh, than that. Um, in terms of the use of the, the garage itself, it is late, it, the floor plan indicates that it is a garage, and yes, there are windows and doors on the elevations. 
the um, access to the garage is actually from the cul-de-sac or the hammerhead that you can see there. So it's not going to be accessed from the south of the site. So it's not going to be accessed near Love Lane. So it'll be accessed within the close of Levine Close. So um, in my view, there wouldn't be any undue um, difficulty in accessing and um, exiting the garage itself. Um, we have, um, during the processing of the application, had the height of the garage reduced slightly and we have attached a couple of conditions on the um, recommendation if it is approved. Condition three states that the garage hereby permitted shall be limited to the domestic and private needs of the occupier of one living close as a garage and for the parking of motor vehicles for the purposes ancillary to the residential use of the dwelling known as one living close and it shall not be used for any other purpose whatsoever. And condition number four restricts the insertion of additional windows. Um, and number five states that the garage hereby approved shall be constructed as a single story building only and shall remain as such for all times thereafter. And so um, the recommendation is to grant consent for a garage on this site, provided it does remain as a garage, and that is why we've attached the recommended conditions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. That means it's 17 feet high. 17 feet high. Um, you know, I would have thought that a garage, I mean, you know, 17 feet seems an inordinately large garage. Uh, and I'm uh, interested that you should say there's a condition that there's no more windows, but there's plenty of windows in it already. I mean, it's got windows on, at least on two sides, maybe even three sides, two sides, I think. Um, so I personally, uh, while I do, I, I think your, your conditions are interesting and good, I still think the objections of the Town Council are quite strong, and it's, it's, it seems to me disproportionate for the size of a garage. 17 feet high and 26 feet long. Yeah, okay, uh, you would get certainly two cars in there, but, but why 17 feet high? Are they, it seems strange to me that it's almost like a house. So I'm sorry, I still think this is a Trojan horse. I, I'm not in favour of this application. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Good morning, Mr Chairman. I actually know where this is. I did a drive-by just to have a look at this for myself. It, you, what's, what it is here is it's on what you might call a piece of wasteland and you have houses, two-storey houses to the one side and a bungalow to the other side and this building is really no higher than the bungalow next door to it and in actual fact it's a huge improvement to what's there already. It wouldn't look out of place at all and if you bear in mind that cars today are longer and bigger than they ever used to be so although it may appear from the outset there's been quite a long garage, cars are much bigger today than what they ever used to be. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's very good, and I would like to move the uh, case officer's uh, actual recommendation to accept. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I've got to be honest, uh, perhaps I'm cynical, but um, it does seem contrived. But at the end of the day, I think the conditions that are attached to it um, are good. Um, and it would be very difficult to turn this down as a garage, but I do agree with the Town Council, I have to say, it does look a bit um, top heavy. Um, but saying that, on balance, I will second the recommendation by Councillor Hendry. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I do share the concerns that have been raised. It does look rather bungalow-like from the drawings, but just in terms of future-proofing, whatever um, we, we pass today, are the dimensions, would they meet the minimum space required should a future application come in for the same footprint to convert this to uh, a dwelling. Ms Parsons. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I was just doing a quick calculation. So um, if it's 8.4 by 4.8, it would be a bit less than 40 square, 40 square metres. 
um, that would be adequate for one person, one bed unit of accommodation, depending on how they laid it out, of course. Um, Thank but you. of course, that would require planning permission. Yep. And also, members, obviously, in terms of the applications we are deciding, we have to decide on the application in, in front of us. Um, and obviously, there, there there are concerns about where this might go, hence the, the conditions that have been uh, introduced by Ms. Parsons. Mrs. DeVries? Thank you. Um, I was just going to reiterate um, really what um, Mrs. Parsons has already said. In terms of the footprint, it's not too dissimilar for the application that we've previously considered for a dwelling in this location. And that was refused on the basis that as a dwelling, it couldn't provide um, adequate parking um, access for the site, amenity for the dwelling. Um, it's also in an area of high flood risk. So the reason for imposing the condition to limit first floor accommodation would in itself make it a bungalow in, in high flood risk. So it's another thing that would secure its use as an ancillary building. Um, but appreciate members' concern in terms of current appearance. Thank you. Any further comments or questions from members before I move to the vote? I'm not seeing anything on the chat. So if we then, we have a recommendation that's been moved and seconded to, to, to grant permission. Uh, if we start this time with Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the presentation and I'm uh, for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. I've seen and heard all the presentation and with the conditions, I am for the thank development. Councillor Bolt. Yes, uh, seen and heard the uh, application and debate and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen it all and heard it all, and I think there'll be a tidy out process. Thank you very much. I'm for it. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I've heard this whole debate, and with conditions, I'm for. Councillor Revens. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the presentation and the debate, and my vote is against. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. I've seen and heard all of the presentation, and I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I, I'm very much for this. Thank you. And yes, I have seen and heard everything. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Um, sorry, Chairman, I had to leave... Um the meeting, so I didn't see the whole presentation, so I will abstain. We'll, we'll, we'll record you as, as being absent from that part of the meeting. Uh, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I've seen and heard the whole presentation and debate, and with the conditions and the explanation, I am for the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the presentation, and I am for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. And Councillor Granter? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've seen and heard the, all of the debate. Uh, although I got reservations, I mean, we can only do what is in front of us, the application, but with the conditions, um, then I will. I am for it. Thank you. And finally, myself, uh, again, I've been here throughout the presentation and debate, uh, and I'm for the recommendation to grant. I think, Mr Nicholson, that's all members accounted for, so if you could confirm the vote, please. Thank you, Chairman, there's 10 in support, two abstentions, and one absent. No, I don't think that's correct. I think the two members voted against rather than abstaining. I can confirm that, Chair. Oh, is it 10, 10 in support? Yes. I didn't mean abstain. I meant okay. voting against, sorry. I might okay. confirm that, Chairman, is, is 10 for, 2 against. And one, and one absent. Thank you very much. And that's all members accounted for. That is the permission granted. So thank you very much. Uh, that brings us, members, to the end of our uh, agenda for this morning. Uh, we will close the meeting and restart again this afternoon at 2.30. Thank you very much.
All members of the committee should have their video on but will remain muted until the chairman invites them to speak. All members of the press and public will remain muted unless they have registered to speak and the chairman will let them know when they can make their representation. The format of the meeting will be as per the agenda published and a copy of the officer presentations can be found on the committee web page. Thank you very much. Uh, can I also welcome you to the meeting? I'm Councillor Filmer, I'm Chairman of the Committee. Uh, just to take you through how we'll operate this afternoon, each application will be taken in turn. The officers will outline the application, followed by the public speaking time. Members will then debate and decide on that application. For members of the committee wishing to speak, uh, please can I remind you to indicate via the uh, online chat and you will be called in turn. During the debate, there will be a proposer and a seconder for a resolution. Members will vote on this proposal in turn, and at that point they will confirm that they've been present throughout the application being considered, and will then vote for, against, or abstain. The votes will then be counted and the result announced. I'll now ask the officers and councillors who will be taking part in this meeting to confirm that they can see and hear me, and to introduce themselves. So if we start with the planning officers, uh, Mrs De Vries. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dawn De Vries. I'm the lead officer for this afternoon and I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Parsons. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Shanta Parsons. I'm the a planning officer and I can see and hear everybody this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr Evans. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Liam Evans. Um, I'll be presenting two of the applications this afternoon. I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Uh, if we come to our legal team, that's uh, Mrs Lehman. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Dawn Lehman. I am the legal advisor to the panel and I can confirm that I can hear and see you. And from our democratic services, Mrs Nicholson. Good afternoon. My name is Leila Nicholson. I'm the committee manager and I can confirm that I can see and hear you. Thank you. We'll next come to the, the members of the committee. So if we start with uh, Councillor Granter. Yes, good afternoon, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Councillor Graham Granter. I represent the Fairfax Ward here in Bridgewater and everybody's coming aloud, along loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Glassford. We'll come back to uh, Councillor Glassford. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, thank you, Chairman. Um, <laughs> Councillor Cathy Pierce, Westover Ward, and I can hear and see you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Okay, we'll come back to Councillor Gibson later. Councillor Scott. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman. It's Councillor Liz Scott here from Axvale Ward near Axbridge. And I can see and hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Somerset District Councillor Alistair Hendry for Burnham on Sea Central. I can see and hear everything. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Is uh, Councillor Murphy? Nope, OK. Uh, Councillor Revens? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Bill Revens from North Pelleton Ward. I can confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kingham. Yes, good afternoon, Chairman. Yes, my name is Stuart Kingham. I'm the ward member for the West Poldens, and I can hear and see you. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Good afternoon, Mr Chairman. I can hear and see everything. I represent North Petherton Ward. <laughs> and you're Councillor Bradford. I am. Thank you, Thank well, you very yes. much. Yes. Well, I've been called worse. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brian Bolt, Wall Council of Cannington and Wemden, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Liz Perry, uh, District Councillor for the King's Isle, and I can hear and see everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Good afternoon, Chairman. No, Councillor Tony Grimes, Deputy Chairman, and I'm from Barrow Ward. Thank you. I can see and hear you. Thank you. If we go back then to Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. I can see and hear you, uh, Alec Glassford, uh, Fairfax Ward. 
Thank you. I'm not seeing Councillor Gibson listed as yet, and I'm not seeing Councillor Murphy either. So if we we'll carry on for the moment and see if they if they join us. Um, just to confirm, I'm, I'm Councillor Filmer. I can see and hear all the comments that have been made by members so far. Uh, in addition to the the members of the committee and officers that we've uh, just been through and, and introduced, there are other officers and. Uh, potentially members of the council who are present, who are here as observers, including the uh, portfolio holder for development. And also we have with us a number of members of the public who are, some are here to uh, to speak as they've registered and others again are here just to observe. If we move then on to the, uh, the items on the agenda, the first item is apologies for absence. Mrs Nicholson, do we have any uh, apologies that have been sent in? Thank you, Chairman. I had received apologies from Councillor Facey and Councillor Gibson, although Councillor Gibson did say she may be coming in. It does look like Councillor Murphy is just joining us now. Do you want to just confirm for me? I will certainly do that. Uh, Councillor Murphy, are you now present? I had to, to go a really circuitous route to try and get in. I've been taking about 15 minutes. I'm here now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sorry, Chairman. Can yeah, I ask Councillor Murphy to bring his, his screen down a bit? Yeah, I think we can only see the top of your head at the moment, Councillor Murphy. Pardon? Oh, you can see it. Sorry about that. Right. That's, That's perfect. It. Excellent. OK, so in terms of apologies, as I understand it, Mrs Nicholson, it was that we've heard we, we've got apologies from Councillor Facey and Councillor Gibson may be delayed in joining us if, if she can get to us. OK, and all other members are present. Uh, item two on the agenda is urgent business. I'm not aware of any urgent business that isn't already covered on our agenda. Public speaking time for, for members of the public, for those of you who've registered to speak, as we get to the applications in turn, the officers will give us the background and the detail of the application and we'll then ask you to address the committee. The process will follow will be that uh, Mrs Nicholson will enable your microphone so that you can address us. You have three minutes uh, to do that. You will hear, uh, when there's one minute left to go, a bell ring. And Mrs Nicholson, again, if you could demonstrate, please. Thank you. Uh, once you hear that bell, that does mean, as I say, that you've got one minute of your presentation time left to go. And when you get to the end of the three minutes, I will then let you know that that time has expired. And, and obviously, we will then move on to the next uh, item for, for the uh, either a presentation or, or debate. Um, if... We move then on to the decorations of interest for this afternoon. Are there any decorations that uh, members have for this afternoon's business? Yet we have Councillor Bolt. Yes, I'm the Ward Councillor for uh, Cannington and Wembden. Uh, items 28 and, uh, sorry, pages 28 and 46. I've taken no part in any consultations with it. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Revens. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, page 38, the Temporary Agricultural Workers Home, uh, Moorlands, uh, it's in the Town Council area of North Petherton and in my District Council ward, and I'm a Town Councillor and District Councillor. I have, however, taken no part in the discussions on this matter. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Uh, yes, Chairman. On page 46, um, the house in question is next to a friend's house, so I need to declare a personal interest, I think. So is, that, is it just a personal interest? It's a non-prejudicial? Non yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bradford. Page 38, Mr Chairman, is... Chairman of North Petherton Town Council, I took no part in any of the any negotiations regarding this. So it's a thank you. Sort of yeah, okay. Non predetermination. Well, non predetermination. That's, that's the word. That thank word. you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, on the um, the last item on page 46, um, I did sit out of the meeting last time as it's a, a friend's house next door, but I will remain in the, in the meeting this time. And, Listen to debate.
Chairman, take your mic off. Sorry, Mrs Lehman, would you like to uh, give some advice, please? Yes, sorry, um, Councillor Kingham. Um, I think we need to be consistent. So if you declared a personal and prejudicial on the last um, application, my advice is to do the same on this application. Okay, I will do so. Thank you very much. Are there any further declarations? If not... Just for, for members of the public, it's important that you know if there's a, a background that members bring to a, an application. So where you've heard a personal declaration of interest, it means that members may have some knowledge of an applicant, objector, or or, a, a, or, or someone who's supported an application. Um, but the knowledge is not such to a degree that it would actually prejudice their views when they come to look at the application. What hang up? Before us. Um, so... In that instance, they can remain within the meeting, they can debate and vote on the application. Where you've heard a member declare a prejudicial interest, it basically means that their view could well be prejudiced by the, the knowledge they have of, of someone involved with the application, and therefore they will leave the room, take no part in the debate, and no part in the vote. And where you've heard other members declare non-predetermination uh, declarations that basically is that we have a standing order within this committee which says that members Boom. can can either be involved at the town and parish council level or they can be involved at the the district level this is to avoid the the, the view that they may if they have been involved at the town and parish level and made a decision it could be perceived that they've prejudged predetermined that in that application before it comes to this committee. So to avoid that happening, that's where you've heard members declare that they've taken no part in those discussions prior to, to this meeting taking part today. Um, Mrs Nicholson, I think, were you wanting to say something? Yes, Chairman, I've just looked back at the previous meeting. Councillor Scott had declared a prejudice, prejudice. She got out of the room <laughs> at the last uh, uh, last application for Lindhurst, so she will need to do the same as Councillor Kingham as well, please. Councillor Scott. Yes, that's what I thought actually. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So that's a prejudicial interest. Uh, that's that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of the declarations of interest. So if we move then on to the applications before us, uh, the first one where we have a speaker present is that one on, on page 28, which is Cannington. So if I could ask Miss Parsons if you'd like to introduce this application, please. Thank you, Chairman. I shall be presenting the application. My colleague Dawn will be running through the slides for me. Um, this is an, an application for residential development on land at Park Lane, Cannington. It is a hybrid application with full details for one detached self-built dwelling towards the western end of the site. And outline application, or the outline part, is with all matters reserved except the means of access for two dwellings adjacent. If we move on to the slide one. In terms of the principle, the main considerations um, really relate to the principle of development. The site is outside of any development boundary, um, and we need to consider whether the proposal complies with the self-build policy, as well as other policies within the local plan. Next slide, please. So this um, indicates the location of the site. The house... Um, is located on the north side of Park Lane, outside of the settlement boundary. The settlement boundary is shown green on the plan that you can see there. That's an extract from the local plan. It's so within a Tier 2 settlement, comprises of a rectangular field measuring approximately 55 metres by 40 metres, and located, as I said, on the north side of Park Lane. Immediately to the west is a dwelling known as the Granary, a converted barn, and to the east and north are open fields, and opposite the road are rows of dwellings. We've gone to the next slide, which is an aerial, and it indicates the approximate, well, the location of this site circled red. The other circles relate to other developments that we may come on to um, a little later on. If we go on to the next slide, that indicates another aerial photograph, slide four, 
which is just a closer view of the of the site. As you can see, it's immediately next to the granary, um, fields to the north and east. On the south side of the development site, there are rows of the houses in Park Lane and then down Chad's Hill towards the south of the village, or the centre of the village. Now, this again is the site, um, clearly without the detail of the aerial coverage. Now, um, if we can go through to the next slide, please. That is showing the layout of the proposed development. The full application is detailed for the dwelling on the left side, on the west side of the plots. The outline um, application relates to the two illustrative plots that you can see on the eastern side of, of the application site. We'll go, I'm going to run through the photographs now before coming back to the... Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is standing, as you can see from the plan on the bottom left corner of the slide, looking into the existing access to the property. Next slide. Oh, these are numbered differently to mine, but never mind. So this is looking further eastwards at the frontage where the proposed site would be. And you can just about see some of the houses in Park Lane that are on the south side of Park Lane. Next slide. And this is a better view straight down the road with the houses facing the site from the south. Next slide. And this is the granary immediately adjacent to the application site. And the, the granary itself is a converted barn to a dwelling. And there you can see the outbuildings. Next slide, please. And this is looking further westwards alongside the frontage of the granary along Park Lane. Next slide. This is standing at the access itself, looking at the gable end of the outbuilding to the granary and the gable end of the granary. And then you can see some of the boundary hedge. Next slide, please. And this is uh, looking straight into the field, looking north northwards, the granary's boundary to the west, and then the field boundary there you can see along, along the north. Next slide, please. Uh, these, this is then looking slightly further to the northeast. And next slide. And this is looking eastwards towards the uh, farm buildings further in the distance. And then the houses fronting Park Lane that you can see towards the right hand side of the slide. We have another one there, and that's looking from within the field to the houses in Park Lane. And another slide shows directly looking southwards at the existing access, looking at the properties in Park Lane. And that's the final photograph slide of the, uh, of the site. Um, could we please go back to the proposed layout? Thank you. Apologies for my delay. Um, in terms of the proposal, again, the application is for full, for um, self-build house that you can see on the left side of the application site area. It shows a detached building, um, a detached house, sorry, with a detached garage towards the frontage of the plot with the proposed access into the site there with a turning area. And adjacent to the east are the is the illustrative layout of the two proposed uh, dwellings. The accesses to the proposed full application, as well as the accesses to the proposed um, two outline units, are to be dealt with at this stage. Now, in terms of updating the report, we've had, um, since the agenda was printed, an additional objection, mainly relating to highway safety, stating that the proposed visibility is not adequate because it doesn't meet the standards of being uh, 43 meters in both directions. 
Now, in terms of the principle of residential development at this site, the uh, main policy considerations are policy CO2, the infilling policy, and policy D9 that relates to self-build policy. Regarding CO2 in the infill policy, it is not considered to amount to infilling of the main built-up area. While there is frontage development along Park Lane opposite the site, the gap between the granary and Park Farm on the north side at the road is significant in size being over 100 metres. It would instead just extend the existing linear settlement pattern in this location. It's not therefore considered to be infill development. In terms of policy D9, the self-build policy, the key consideration is whether the site meets the locational requirements of policy D9 in terms of whether it's well related to the existing settlement boundary of Cannington. Sites are generally thought to be well related where they integrate well with the existing built form of the settlement, where local services are within an easy and safe walking distance. It's not considered that the site is physically well related as it is outside the settlement boundary. It's rural in nature, sited alongside a narrow single track road and separate from the main built up area of Cannington. So in terms of the principle of the development here in this location, the principle of, of the development for residential purposes as proposed fails to meet the policy criteria within CO2 and D9. It's not considered to be infill development and it's not well related to the existing settlement boundary. In terms of the impact on the character of the area, the site is outside the settlement boundary clearly, immediately adjacent to one dwelling and other residential dwellings on the other side of the road. The development within the vicinity of the site comprises of a variety of designs, forms and ages, and there is no distinct vernacular. With regard to the full application, the proposed house would be of a traditional modern form, set back from the road with a detached garage towards the front of the site. The buildings would be finished in brick and tiles, and in terms of the outline part of the application, this would be for two dwellings, which are illustrated to be sited alongside the plot for the full permission, and while the houses and the garages would be sited on elevated land in relation to the land and fields to the north, the westernmost house and garage will be generally in line with the granary on one side to the west, and when viewed from any public vantage point to the north, the nearest of which would be from the bypass, the houses and garages would be seen as part of a continuous development with the existing houses to the west, and as the view would be at significant distance, it would not stand out as particularly visually obtrusive. In terms of the impact on a neighbouring residence, the westernmost house would be sited approximately 5 metres from the boundary with the granary to the west, and 30 metres from the houses opposite in Park Lane. And while the proposed garage would be sited close to the boundary with the granary, it would be in line with the existing outbuildings of the granary. There would be no first floor windows in the end west elevation, and as such, the development would not give rise to undue overlooking or loss of privacy. And in terms of the height and location of the house, it would have no adverse impact on the amenities of the properties opposite or to the side in terms of loss of light or visual domination. With regards to highway safety, there is an existing access to the site at the western end of the frontage of Park Lane. This would be altered to provide an access for the westernmost dwelling, and two additional accesses would serve the two outlined dwellings to the east. The visibility displays shown for the westernmost dwelling are 27 metres by 2.4 metres in a westerly direction, and at least 43 metres to the east. And while the requirement for visibility displays where vehicles are restricted to 30 miles an hour are um, 43 metres, it's considered the speed of traffic along Park Lane is likely to be less than 30 miles an hour. Therefore, taking this into consideration and the fact that there is an existing access, the visibility of the access would not give rise to undue highway, highway, um, highway safety, um, highway danger. If, for example, um, drivers were to drive along there at 20 miles an hour, the visibility display required would be 25 metres. In this case, 
for the display to be 27 metres, it's considered that it's acceptable in highway terms. And in conclusion, while it's not considered that the development would have any adverse impact on the amenities of neighbouring re residents, the character of the area or highway safety, the principle of development fails to meet policy criteria due to the site not being considered infill or well related to the existing built form of the village and therefore the recommendation is to refuse consent. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. As you'll see, we have a, a couple of speakers on this application. The first we have is, is Richard Orton. So, Mrs Nicholson, if I could ask you to enable the microphone, please. And Mr Orton, if you could just confirm that the microphone's working. Uh, yes, yes, it seems to be working. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, just to remind you, you've got three minutes to address the committee. Uh, and we'll, you'll hear the bell go when there's a minute of the time left to go. So, start whenever you're ready, please. Right, right. Um, all I really want to do is to support the Sedgemoor local plan. Um, as councillors are aware, the plan prescribes a development area which doesn't include Park Lane. The plan names some exceptional situations in which planning permission may be granted outside the development area, but the principal planning officer has shown that none of these applies in this case. Um, as I understand it, the, uh, the, the reason why the application nonetheless comes before the committee is that Councillor Dyer is in favour of it for the reasons he has given in his email to the case officer. Um, he isn't saying that the application falls within any of the exceptional situations. He simply says that the local plan is wrong because it should include Park Lane uh, within the development area. The uh, result of this would be to open up uh, the whole of Park Lane on both sides to residential development, and that surely would also be the result in practice of granting this application. Um, those who devised the local plan didn't think that Park Lane could sustain this sort of development, and the local plan inspector um, endorsed this, this view. Um, as, as a former um, solicitor, I suffer from a compulsion to descend into legal thinking, and I hope I shan't put the committee's backs up by mentioning a couple of points. Um, Section 38.6 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004 says that a planning application must be determined in accordance with the local plan unless material circumstances indicate um, otherwise. Um, it's also clear, and here I'm, I'm, I'm quoting, that if, the, if committee members are proposing to make a decision contrary to officer recommendations or contrary to the local plan, they uh, should clearly identify the planning reasons for doing so and that they may have to justify their decision by giving evidence in the event of any challenge. Um, I hope I shall be uh, forgiven for uh, mentioning what you may think to be this uh, pettifogging stuff. I'm certainly not trying in any way to question the committee's discretion but these points do seem to uh, support what I'm trying to contend, which is simply that there is there are very good reasons to stick to what the local plan says and no good reason to depart from it. Thank you very much, Mr. Orton. That's Thank you. perfectly timed as well. Thank you. We have a, a second speaker, which is uh, Lyndon Brett. So again, Mrs. Nicholson, if you could enable the speaker's microphone. And Mr. Brett, if you could just let us know that the microphone's working. So thank you, I can. That's um, ter terrific, thank you very much. Again, as you know, you've got the three minutes. You'll hear the bell go when there's a minute to go and start whenever you're ready, please. Chairman and members, this is a tier two settlement permitted to accept growth in the local plan in a district which is under pressure from housing needs through HBC and where self-build is permissible to accord with government targets. 
We were encouraged to support and um, submit an affordable market value scheme for six units by the then parish chairman and ward councillor under the former local plan, which at the time we held back and awaited the new local plan. When submitted, we were advised to withdraw that application on the grounds of overdevelopment. This paired back scheme deals with those issues. This is a hybrid application for a self-build full plan submission for an omni-access property and outline permission for the other two plots for self-build development only. The Omni House is for the applicant who is in rented accommodation adjoining her parents' farm so that support care is on hand. The House Superior Cottage cannot be adapted to meet the future needs of the applicant who has endured a brain tumour and has had to undergo two 14-hour operations and whose life and future mobility is impaired. The Omni Access Dwelling is designed to cater for the stages of deterioration in her health, including reduced mobility. Scale and massing are not an issue and there is no criticism of the design. The development line of Park Lane is dominated from distant view to the north by the principal houses of Park Farm and its range of agricultural buildings midway along Park Lane, plus Knapp Farm to the west and housing at higher level to the south side of Park Lane. Park Lane is not in open countryside and meets these attributes are well related and well located, being 90% developed to one side of the road and 60% to the other. The site is well related and well located to the village centre, as demonstrated by the consent for the kitchen garden plot on the same side of the road. Permission revolves around the broken frontage and whether this site is more an open countryside than I would suggest the 73 houses permitted in Greenfield location on the edge of Cannington with its greater unbroken frontage. The site's sustainable credentials in terms of accessibility is a given and consistent with the other properties which front Park Lane including the new dwelling consented on the same side. Whilst there is no pavement leading to village of Park Lane uh, or Chad's Hill, there are pavements on Broadway Hill and High Street to which these roads connect. Previously, residents of Park Lane accessed the village on foot over a carriageway shared with HGV traffic, all of which have been removed by virtue of the bypass. Would it be right to refuse this application on a policy which was designed to support measured growth in settlements, yet a 10% increase in housing numbers on a delegated decision for 73 homes permitted on 10 acres of productive agricultural land in open countryside outside of the village development with a significant broken frontage more removed from the settlement facilities than this site? Modern farming practices and arable machinery means that it is not practical to farm this small parcel of frontage land. From a practical perspective, this site is not in open countryside any more so than the development permitted south of the village. Thank you, Mr. Brett. Brett, I'm sorry, we'll have to call time on you there, but but thank you very much for your comments. Right, before I come to to, to members, uh, Miss Parsons, is there anything you wanted to comment on that's been raised by the the speakers? And I'll also come to to Mrs. Lehman as well, because there was an issue raised which we might just need to touch on with, with legal. Ms. Parsons? If Ms. Parsons sorry. isn't... Ah, yeah. sorry. I thought um, we'd lost no, you. No, there isn't, actually, at this okay. stage. Thank you. That's fine. Mrs. Lehman? Thank you, Chairman. Um, the last speaker raised an issue about... Um, a long-term impairment of um, disability. Um, the issue for us now is that it's been raised at this very late stage. Um, I do not know whether the case officer has had any evidence of this, and we will need to see some evidence to substantiate the comments made by the speaker. Um, if there is evidence to say that there is a long-term impairment that falls within the Equality Act and our duty under the public Sector equality duty to have due regard to the long term impairment, which is um, a material consideration, to have due regard to that issue, which is then balanced against the policies of the development plan. Um, if, if the case officer isn't aware of that and, and we feel that we need to investigate this further, then I feel that we may have to look at a deferment, but I will leave that to the case officer and maybe Dawn de Vries to um, provide any more information on this point. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Mrs de Vries, I think you indicated you wanted to comment. Yes, thank you. Um, Just based on the points raised by the speaker, my understanding is that it's a relative of the person with the health conditions that's applied for the self-build development. 
the application is for a self-built property, not a personalised consent based on any medical grounds. So my um, opinion is that we can assess it under the self-build policies, um, but it's for members to, to assess the development as proposed as a self-build development against those policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's that's clear. Members, any comments or questions then, please? I think Councillor Kingham, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, we were in Cannington a few meetings ago, similar to development new house which they wish to build outside of um, the development area. And I think we have to be consistent with our planning decisions. And I think that we ought to go along the same route as we did before and refuse this application as the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. Yeah, sorry, you said it was clear. Um, it, unfortunately, it's clear as mud to me. Uh, what uh, Mrs Lehman raised, has that been taken into account or does it not need to be taken into account? That's what I want to be clear on. Mrs DeVries, do you want to just uh, outline that again? Yeah. Mike? It's, um, if there were medical reasons for the applicant to be applying for something that's contrary to policy, then it would be a material consideration for that application. The medical grounds that were mentioned were in association with um, a care role that the applicant would be undertaking. So it's not actually um, a medical situation linked with the applicant for the development. So in terms of the development itself, um, it's not directly linked to and hasn't been promoted as a personalised consent. It's been promoted against the adopted policy. Yeah, thank you. I've got to know. OK. Any, any other questions, Councillor Bolt, or you... No, I'm fine with that. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Hendry. Good afternoon, Mr Chairman. I, I noticed in one of the first photographs there was four or five cars parked on the on the grass verge of the side uh, to the entrance or the proposed entrance of this development. If this development went ahead, where would these other, yeah, all these cars, if this development was to go ahead, I presume these vehicles belong to the houses on the other side of the road. So if they don't have parking, well, if they did have parking, why are these vehicles there? And if they don't have parking, where would these vehicles park themselves if that area was taken away and it was given over to the new development? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think to some extent, that's, is that a rhetorical question? You weren't expecting the officers to... Well, it's, it's, it's parking. It's kind of traffic onto that main road. Yep. If, the, if these vehicles are actually taken away because that becomes the entrance onto a new development... Where would these cars? Where would these cars actually park? Would they block up the road? Then would they have to park on the other side of the road, outside the houses, and therefore causing traffic okay. congestion? Okay, Miss Parsons. Um, really, I can confirm that the um, the plan that was up there just now that showed the hatched um, showed the layout and the hatch lines there. That's actually highway land, and so um, I can imagine that's why people do park there to get off of the the central carriageway of Park Lane. So we would have no control over the hatched area other than the fact that we wouldn't be able to park directly in front of the access into the sites. So the answer would be they could still park on the highway if they need to park on the highway on the hatched area, but not in front of the accesses. Otherwise, they would need to park on the highway as any other vehicle would. Thank you very much. I've got Councillor Bradford and then Councillor Scott, so Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr Chairman. The first question has been asked, so where would all those cars, where would all those cars that were parked there park eventually? That would be an issue to start, I think. Unless they're parking willy-nilly, I don't know. Um, I did pay a site visit to this site Friday afternoon, actually. I had to go to Cannington Grain on business and I came back through Park Lane and drove up and down and and, and observed, because I was just reading my reports that there was a lot of lot of issues, a lot of controversy about it, this, and I couldn't could come to terms with some, to be frank with you. Um, I, I don't know about local plans, and all of a sudden, 73 houses are granted outside of this one. And when you look at this particular plan, it's, it, it, it's a prime example, actually, if things would have been normal, this would have been a site visit. 
I put my right arm on it. This would have been a site visit in normal circumstances, but it's not a site visit. But, but, but I've had the, well, I've, I've seen it. I've seen the site. I've seen the site. It's the long where we used to park for cricket, playing cricket on the SF high ground, which is parked along opposite those houses. And, and, and they were all council houses at one stage, 25, 30 years ago, believe you me. So the, old, the old gentleman used to sit outside in their gardens and watch us. And, uh, but Callington is a changed area since we, we all know what's happened with the EDF and, uh, and the buildings that have gone up everywhere. It's a tremendous place, a tremendous change. And, and I feel that some of the things that were said this afternoon here, um, regarding the, and the last thing that came in, um, Dawn Lehman spoke about maybe a deferral until more details are found out regarding and the member of family that, that, that I know has a has a personal problem, a very serious problem, and you're going to need a lot of care in the future. There's no question about that. It's a, it's a tiny bit of land, this is. This, this particular farmer, I suppose that when the bypass came through, he can't help, he was left with a lot of bits and pieces. And this is another bit and pieces that are left. And, and with modern machinery and farming like it is, there's no way that can be farmed. No way at all. So what, what is going to happen to that little bit of land? What is going to happen eventually to some of it? You know, and I, and I think a little bit of vision is needed here. And uh, pe people keep on about these local plans, but they're never in place when something comes around. And, or all of a sudden, somebody can come in with major developments and, and, and distort things. And that puts people with double standards. I hear what Councillor Hendry had to say and Councillor King on bits. Uh, I think it's a little bit different than what it was a fortnight ago, to be frank. And, uh, you know, but, but I iterate what I say, that had this been a normal times, this would have been a, a, site, a, a site visit. There's no question about that for clarification. And regarding the highway, the lane, well, there was a time when the quarry was out on the other side of Cannington, that lorries and that would be up and down there before the bypass came through. But now it's quite a quite a civilized quiet lane what i can say of it and, uh, and pavements were mentioned etc but when you think of what else happened in cannington in the last 10 years you know and uh, <laughs> we have to be very very careful in what we're doing and i hear the solicitor the words he was saying you know and uh, <laughs> at the end of the day we got to make us we got to make the decisions not the solicitors okay thank you mr chairman <laughs> thank you uh Councillor Scott, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do think that we should be consistent in our view on this. We did have a case a few weeks ago in Cannington that was just outside the boundary, and it wasn't acceptable. Again, I feel this one is the same. It's unfortunate that the um, circumstances of the applicant has just really come to light. Um, one might think of that slightly differently, but I'm still confused about why this is a hybrid application applying for full permission on this one, and then two outline next door. Um, if it was just for you know, the, the needs of the one person, I'm not sure why we would be considering three properties. So I'm afraid at this point in time, I have to go along with the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Parsons, do you want to just address the, the policy issue as to why it would be potentially three rather than one? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't know why the, I mean, the agent has put in a planning application for three dwellings. I, I can't really advise on the reasoning for that. Okay, I've got Mrs. DeVries. Thank you. Um, I think the the reason it's coming as three is because the policy or the principal policy is, is trying to um, sort of seek compliance with is the infill development. So in terms of looking at the layout plan effectively, um, albeit it's still separated by um, a field parcel, it was looking to infill between sort of this barn conversion premises and the farm. But the infill of three units in this space wasn't considered by officers to be an infilling of, of an already established built up frontage. But if you had one unit, um, it would need to be of a comparable size and scale to the adjoining properties. And with a vacant field next to it, it definitely wouldn't be compliant. We're still arguing three within that land parcel isn't compliant. 
um, but three filling up a whole land parcel up to the adjoining neighbour's land is a closer match than than one would have been, which is um, I'm assuming why it's coming as three, not one. Um, but as self-build development, it needs to be the future occupier who is involved in the design solution for the property. So the applicant is compliant with the self-build um, element in terms of the fact that they have designed their own house and the other two are in outline to allow um, whoever the future two occupiers would be to get involved in the design solution to make them self-build units. So that's why it's ones in detail and two are in outline. Um, and I suspect that's why it's three instead of one in terms of policy compliance. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, after listening to the debate quite carefully, I, I have to say, I have to go with the officers on this. Um, I don't consider it's an infill, and it is outside the settlement boundary, and I think we do have to be clear on where we're going, so I'm going to move the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in, in the light of consistency and the report from the officers, I would like to um, second the recommendation to refuse. Thank you very much. Are there any further comments or questions from members before we move to a vote? I'm not seeing anyone indicate. So, again, as, as usual, I will come round to members in turn asking uh, Miss, Mrs. Lehman, just before I do that, you wanted to comment? Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I remember um, the case officer um, um, saying about a late objection in relation to the highway visibility display. Was that going to be a, another reason for refusal? Or is this one that could be overcome by conditions should um, the matter be appealed? I think, Ms. Parsons, do you want to clarify in the, in the view on the, the highways and access? Yes, thank you. Um, no, the the view of the access that the visibility display was inadequate was not the view of the case officers. We considered the access and the restricted visibility and taking into account the speed of traffic likely to be going along that road, we considered the visibility to be appropriate. Thank you. So, in effect, the, the proposal we have in front of us from, from the members is, is as per the as per the report. So the recommendation for refusal has been made and seconded. We'll as I say we'll come to members in turn. We'll start this time with Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard everything, and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. I've seen and heard everything, and I'm I'm for refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. Seen and heard everything for the refusal. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. I'm the same, Mr Chairman. I've heard all the, all the debate. Thank you very much. Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've listened to the debate and I'm for the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Revens. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I've heard an, the presentation and the debate and I am for the proposal. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have seen and heard the whole presentation, and I am for the resolution. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I can confirm I've seen and heard everything, and yes, I'm for. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm for the um, officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I am for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the debate. I am for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. And Councillor Granta. Yes, Chairman, I've seen and heard the, the debate and uh, I am for the officer's recommendation of refusal. Thank you. Thank you. And finally myself, I've also heard and seen the whole debate uh, and I'm also for the proposal for refusal. I think Mrs Nicholson, that's all members? If yes, you could... Chairman, and it's a unanimous vote. No, it, I'm sorry, it wasn't. wasn't it? We, had one, we had one abstention. 
I believe. Can I just Sorry, confirm? Sorry, I didn't hear any abstentions. It was Council all me. Councillor Bradford, could I just confirm what your vote was, please? He agreed abstained, with everything. Mr. Chairman. I abstained. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I had Councillor Bradford down as an abstention. So, in terms of the number of votes, four. Do we make it 12? 12 and one abstention in that case, then. Okay. Thank you so for that... the clarification. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Okay, thank you very much. That is clearly, obviously, carried in terms of the, the proposal that was put for refusal, so permission is is refused. If we move then, members, to the next application where we have a speaker present, and that's on page 38, and we move to Moreland. And Mr Evans, would you like to introduce this one, please? Thank you, Chairman. Let's get this from the beginning. Right, OK, so this application is seeking consent for the siting of an agricultural worker's mobile home uh, and on a site to the edge of Moorland. Um, this is the application site indicated with the white arrow here. Uh, there are two agricultural buildings on the site at present with an access that comes along this trackway here that leads off the highway here. So in terms of context, we have the church in the centre of the village here and the district village hall here. The application site is indicated in red, with the existing access also indicated in red coming from the southeast. It comes between two existing residential properties that are along the highway, with the two agricultural buildings located here. The location of the, the mobile home is indicated with the yellow box here. This is a view of the application site from the highway. Um, as you can see, the agricultural buildings are here. Just out of shot is another one just beyond here. Um, indicated by the arrow here is also the application site where you'll see the, uh, there is actually a mobile home already in situ um, at the site. So again, here are the existing agricultural buildings. And this is the location of the mobile home here with the existing trackway leading to the site. This is sort of a zoomed in image from the entrance way of the location of the agricultural workers mobile home. So the consent is sought for the uh, siting of the mobile home. Um, the application follows a similar proposal in 2018, which was refused on the basis of functional need not being demonstrated for the uh, agricultural workers mobile home, as well as location in flood zone 3A. The application itself is similar in in terms of its, the proposal we have in front of us, uh, the agricultural holding has been is extended during the time since the refusal, albeit with it acquiring more rented land to add to the holding rather than outright uh, buying the land for owner occupation. Um, in fact, the, the in fact the land that's actually acquired by the applicant has decreased uh, in terms of owner ownership of the land attached to the holding. Um, so we do have a holding which is larger scale, but uh, on the basis of it being rented rather than rather than paid for uh, outright. The stock numbers uh, within the agricultural appraisal submitted were consistent with the level that were submitted in the 2018 application. However, I have been told by the applicant's agent that this has increased since the application has been with us um, from 28 suckler cows to 74 cattle now uh, attributed to the, the business itself. So policy D10 sets out the requirements for uh, an agricultural worker's dwelling um, and also touches upon where this would apply to an agricultural worker's mobile home. It requires it requires a functional need to be demonstrated as well as demonstrating that the business has been planned on a sound financial basis. At present, it's not considered that the, a functional need has been demonstrated given that the standard mandate calculation is, has actually decreased since the 2018 application was refused um, based upon the level of activity that's taking place within the business at present. 
the applicant had been requested to provide financial justification, uh, sorry, financial information along with the uh, information already submitted with the application, and this has now been provided. Unfortunately, it does demonstrate that the business has op been operating at a loss for the last three years, um, and in this respect, it's not considered that the business has been planned on a sound financial basis at present. Turning to the other issue with the application, the site is located in Flood Zone 3. The majority of the applicant's land holdings is also located in Flood Zone 3, as is the majority of the area of Moorland. Um, the submitted application is considered to be contrary to the advice within the planning practice guidance, as well as policy D1, which sets to avoid risk by directing development away from high-risk flood zones. Uh, the application is for an agricultural workers' mobile home, which will be occupied by the applicant's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with an in, with a express interest of developing the business over time. Uh, therefore, it is considered to be a highly vulnerable development located within a high-risk flood zone, which has to be demonstrated within the report as taken from the PPG. The table sets out that this is not an appropriate development in this location. Uh, it should be also be noted the Environment Agency have objected to the pro proposal on this basis. So in summary, the application site itself is located in the high-risk flood zone. Is not considered that the application itself is demonstrated a functional need for the accommodation based on the level of stock and land holdings that have been provided. The application is located in the high-risk flood zone and therefore is not considered to be compatible with the existing land in terms of flood risk. Therefore, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Again, we have a speaker on this application, um, James Venton. Uh, Mrs. Nicholson, if you could please uh, engage with. Uh, sorry, enable uh, Mr. Venton's microphone. And could you just confirm it's working, please? Afternoon, Chairman. Excellent. Thank you. That's terrific. Uh, again, as, as you know, you've got the three minutes. You'll hear the bell go um, when there's a minute to go and uh, start whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, members. Um, there are two relevant points I wanted to pick up on in this case. Uh, the firstly, the functional need for a worker to re reside on site. And secondly, the matter of flood risk. With regards to the functional need, these types of applications are always finely balanced. When building an enterprise from scratch, as is the case here, there becomes, if you like, a tipping point. When such an enterprise starts up, they're usually done so with the applicant having to provide an income from an alternative source, as the enterprise in the early days cannot sustain a suitable income. As the business grows, the tipping point comes where the applicant is unable to sustain a full-time job elsewhere and be able to give sufficient time to the development of the business. This is the point we are at here. The business has grown to a point whereby to enable its continued development, the applicant has to switch and make the leap, if you like, from employment elsewhere to being 100% focused on the continued development of the business. This temporary three-year consent route is wholly designed for this exact situation and gives the applicant the time to continue to build the business over that three-year period. We believe the fact that the enterprise has been running for approximately 10 years, this shows a definite intent by the applicant to continue to grow the business. As mentioned above, the tipping point, if you like, has been reached. Further intent is shown through the application that is running alongside this one for the significant extension to the existing buildings on site, which will enable the applicant to continue to expand the business further over the course of the next three years. Even during the period of this application, the livestock numbers of the holding have increased from 55 head of cattle stated in the appraisal to 74 head of cattle at the time of this presentation. The matter pertaining to flood risk is an interesting one. Yes, the site is deemed to be in a high-risk flood zone, but so too is all of the applicants' land. Flooding issues related to moorland are well documented. However, what isn't taken into consideration, it would seem, are the millions of pounds invested into the area's flood defence infrastructure over the past five years or so. The enterprise is situated where it is, and there is a need for the applicant to reside on site for the welfare of his livestock, and equally importantly, the continued growth of the business. Interestingly, this site did not this last winter, and the data suggests that there was more rainfall in this last year than on these moors than there was during the floods of 13-14, suggesting most strongly that the flood defence works work. We believe that the site is safe from flood risk, as argued most strongly within the FRA submitted. In a time where agricultural enterprises are going to the wall almost on a weekly basis, I think in this case, uh, whereby an individual is determined to start up an agricultural enterprise from virtually nothing, um, that such an individual should be highly commended and not discouraged. The temporary consent, as mentioned, gives the applicant the platform to prove the continued viability of the business moving forward. We ask members to support both the applicant and the fully supportive views of North Petherton Town Council and grant consent for this proposal. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you very much. I have a, a couple of members have already indicated. So we've got Councillors Perry and then Revens. So Councillor Perry. Sorry about that. I couldn't find the, find the mouse. Um, yeah, um, I've had quite a few um, thoughts on this and uh, this this farmer should be given a chance. If it's only for three years, um, and what are we saying about the um, drainage um, problems that they had at Moreland? Do, do we not sort of trust there that they all these are going to work? I I think that we've got to give this this person a chance to to grow his business if it's only for three years. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this one reminded me of an application that I think was approved down at Cox Hill near North Newton I think a couple of years ago. Um, quite similar situation. And I believe we did did approve it um, with with conditions. Um, it does feel to me that this is a little bit of a, a catch twenty two that the business owner is in a position that he can't expand until he has um, on site accommodation, and he can't get on site accommodation until he can expand, um, which puts him and and now us in in, in a difficult situation. Um, I listened very carefully to. Um, the, both Mr. Evans and, and the speaker, and I was interested to hear that the number of cows has increased. I think I heard 74 was the figure that um, was given. In that case, presumably, in the supporting agricultural assessments, um, the calculation for how many uh, um, man hours was required, or person hours, I suppose I should say, um, would have increased as well. I, I, I recall it was two thirds of a, of a full time equivalent in the in the assessment. Presumably that figure is now higher, in which case the functional need may well have been demonstrated. Uh, I just wonder whether we could just have clarification on that, please. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Yes, uh, the agricultural appraisal did indicate that um, for uh, the 28 suckler cows that were provided at the time of the agricultural appraisal, that this would equate to 37.8 uh, uh, in terms of the contribution to standard man day. So naturally, if there was an increase of of, uh, of stock, to uh, this would obviously go up as well. Um, at this point in time, uh, as officers, we've had regard to the previous application that was submitted in 2018, which in terms of stand man days and also owner occupied land, uh, we were in a, the, the applicant was in a, well, in a slightly stronger position then than they are now. So from our perspective, we are recommending refusal on the basis that the applicant hasn't increased that side of things in terms of providing the, uh, the increase that would have been expected over that two-year period. But I appreciate the point that, yes, if there has been an increase in stock in the time since this application has been with us and since the agricultural appraisal was submitted, then that calculation would have to be revisited and potentially increased in terms of the uh, number of standard man days or the, the closer to getting closer to the standard man day that they would require to demonstrate a functional need. Thank you. Mrs. Okay, Debray. so can, can I just, just clarify oh. that point? Okay. I think, I think you said 30... 37 hours, Mr. Evans? The, um, so the, uh, the, at the moment, the labor required in terms of taking into account all of the, uh, the acreage and the stock um, and the farm maintenance repairs, et cetera, and the management, uh, at the moment, the total holding hours is 186. 0.64 on the standard mandate calculation they provided the agricultural appraisal. If the suckler cows, if the if the stock has increased, then naturally that will get closer to the um, the calculation that they would require. Um, so at the moment we have uh, 58, uh, 28 suckler cows, 30 calves. That's gone up to 74, I believe, in total. So naturally that's added a few more hours to the to the calculation. I don't think it will have reached the standard mandate 
calculation of one, which is what they require uh, to demonstrate that functional functional requirement. But obviously, it is inching it closer to to that to that final total. Yeah, I'm but I'm just doing the calculations on the back of an envelope here, and I think they're, they're, they are they are pretty close. But I, I'm not an expert in, in this field. I see Councillor Bradford's put down down to speak next. I'll be interested. To, he probably has more knowledge of of the amount of time that that, that it takes to look after. Um, I, I I'd like to come back on on the flooding points, but I think the I think the functional need is the first first thing we need to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. DeVries. Thank you. Um, it, it was just if we start with the functional need then uh, to start off with, obviously, in terms of planning considerations, one of the things we have to look at for this site is the planning history. So it was refused planning permission in 2018 and it was submitted with standard mandate calculations at that point and a case put forward for the size of the land at that point. Um, because of the flood risk and because they couldn't justify they needed a full worker on site, we couldn't justify placing anyone at risk in a mobile caravan in flood zone 3A. So the the flood risk element can almost address itself if we can get to a point where we can justify that accommodation is needed on site. So in terms of justifying the need, the balance that we have to consider with this application is obviously there's a small area of land that is owned by the applicant which since the 2018 application has actually reduced. So they own less land now than what they did previously. They rent more land, which is fine because the hours that they put into working those areas of land count in terms of how they work up the standard mandates. But if they're looking to intensify the business by having more livestock, there is another application in parallel to this to extend the existing buildings because it is an emerging business that they're trying to grow up to getting a standard mandate in. Um, the risk is if they don't own the land that the animals are dependent on, it's a high risk venture in terms of how they're going to grow that business. So then looking at whether it's been planned on a financially sound basis, we had a look at the accounts because what you would expect to see or what you would hope to see is some sort of projection in terms of how they will sustain their growth and how they will build their business over the next three years to get to the point where they are self-sustaining at the end of the three-year period. With the accounts that we've had in, unfortunately, what it's shown is over the last three years, they've made a loss every year for the last three years, and the loss appears to be getting bigger every three years. So with that and the fact they need to extend their agricultural buildings to get to the point where they can accommodate the animals we're not satisfied at this moment in time I'm, I'm not saying we will never be satisfied but we're not satisfied at this moment in time that they've gone through the right process to demonstrate that they have a sound business that they can build to the point where they require someone out on site which would then justify the risk of having someone out on site in a mobile caravan in flood zone three but but it is a it is a juggle with all of those factors we have to take into account. But our concern is, given the 2018 consent, not enough has changed and we haven't got enough information at this point to justify you turning on that decision and now supporting a business without the backing to show that the business can support itself in three years time. If we did end up granting a temporary consent now with the level of uncertainty that we've got, concern would be, it's a lot harder to get someone out of a mobile home if they've sold whatever residence they're in and they're occupying temporary accommodation. Effectively, we as a council would then be making someone homeless after a three year period of a business failing. But that that's a consideration for the next application. But for this application, members have to be satisfied that they've got enough information in front of them that they can be satisfied that the, the site at least has the possibility of becoming self-sustaining at the end of a three-year period and at the moment we're just not satisfied we've got that information so we are recommending refusal. Thank you very much I've got councillors Bradford, Kingham and Scott so councillor Bradford. Thank you Mr Chairman and thank you Dawn for filling it in on a lot of things. I think first of all the flood, the, a big issue made of these floods, there's an awful lot of money been spent on it more and etc etc in the last five years and hopefully that will never, never happen again. So we can probably eradicate that one. I'm in a little bit of doubt about the emerging business. And I was going to suggest perhaps we 
we defer this for probably two for two sessions and get an up-to-date stock numbers I, I I would think and there may have been a bit of trouble within the business here and the, and, and the gentleman concerned probably may have sold some land off and that raises finance to buy stock but it takes time to buy stock and it just takes a little bit of time for things to kick in because regarding his stocking numbers he isn't too far away from what he requires really and I think there is some doubt of what he's actually got at present and really what I what I am going to suggest I think is to defer this for two sessions so we've got an up-to-date number the number of stock on his farm and we can probably make a decision a lot easier but I do feel sometimes another way of, of, of pushing the old farmer down again not giving anybody a chance to get the red above water because they're going to need all these farmers or what's happening I would imagine and a place like Moreland is predominantly a grass growing area all you can do is grow grass so this just this, this chap's got the enterprise right and really to be interested to see what numbers he's got all right and thank, thank you Councillor Revan having so much confidence in me Thank you. Councillor Kingham? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I mean to say I agree with a lot of um, Mrs. DeFries's um, information. Um, I noticed that we've already got a mobile home on site, which presumably is occupied. Um, and looking back to the relevant history, I, obviously they withdrew this application last time for whatever reason. And now they feel that it, uh, now is the time for them to try again, which I'm not sure is correct. Um, again, flood zone three. I don't think you can ever say that it won't flood again because that's uh, chanching your arm a little bit. I think you know because it it does flood. Um, you can't say it won't go away, even though there's been a lot of money spent in the area. And obviously, as it looks, I don't think the farm is actually financial position to extend it with an extra worker so um, I have to go along with what the officers are recommending at the moment thank you thank you uh, councillor Scott thank you chairman um, this is a difficult one because it's obviously somebody who's very keen to um, get their foot in the door with agriculture and like it's been said you know it, it's a tough tough life and it does need quite a bit of finance up front to actually progress so I can, I can understand how somebody's been making a loss over three years um, to, if he's been building his stock um, I've been a little bit worried about the um, enterprise I think the officer said there was another application in to extend the buildings there because obviously if he's going to grow his stock he needs to have more buildings I would think I'd be interested to know that but I'd also like to go along with perhaps what um, Councillor Bradford say if possible to defer it um, for to know what's actually happening and see whether there will be a, a further plan through the winter and next year um, my other concern is it is in 3A and this is a designated area for not allowing mobile homes in a floodplain and we've already refused several mobile homes in floodplain 3A um, so it is really going against what we have agreed in the past if we permit it. Um, so I'm a little bit undecided at the moment. So if anyone else would like to say something, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. I've got uh, Mrs. Debris. Thank you. Um, it was just going back to the flood risk. Apologies, because I realised we looked at the principle but didn't actually go on to flood risk. If if we're not satisfied that there's a local need for this accommodation in this location at this point, um, effectively in terms of flood zone 3A it's a highly vulnerable use in a high flood risk area so whether it's protected by flood defences or not when we consider the, these types of development you have to consider it in the circumstances where there may be a breach so in the event of a breach it's a highly vulnerable use in a high flood risk area and sequentially if you were looking to put a highly vulnerable use the search area outside of the settlement boundary would be the whole of the district so there will be other areas in the district that will be at lower flood risk than this site which is why the flood risk and the justification of need 
are sort of interrelated. If if there isn't a justification for need for the accommodation on the site, then there is an objection in terms of flood risk. Whether it's defended or not, we have to consider it undefended. And currently there is an objection from the Environment Agency on the development. So it is it is a two um two reasons for refusal in terms of unjustified need resulting in inappropriate development in the countryside and also impact on flood risk with the introduction of a highly vulnerable vulnerable use. Could I just ask a question, in whether it's Mrs DeVries or Mr Evans, I, I don't mind. In terms of this procedure, um, are we on the first application in this particular one so that there could potentially be, were it refused, there could be a, a in effect a free go for people to come back with further information if that was required? My understanding is over a year lapsed between their withdrawn application um, or the refused application and their current application. So I think they're entitled to a free go for a second application, but I'm happy to be corrected if Liam knows otherwise. Mr Evans? If you could bear with me a second, I'm just going to open up the planning file and see where we're at in terms of the... Uh, my understanding, like Dawn says, is that this application has, has been submitted uh, over a year after the previous application, which was refused. So they have paid a fee on this application. So if, if, if the application was determined today, they would be entitled to a free go within a year of the date of the decision being made today. Um, so that, that would be a possibility if they did uh, want to exercise that right in the future. Thank you. I've got then Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Glassford, please. Uh, no, I'm absolutely fine, Mr Chairman. Everything I was about to ask has just been answered, so I, I can pass on this. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Listening to uh, the advice given to us by both the officers in that, I'd like to propose that we go along with the officers' recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, yeah, Councillor Glassford said exactly uh, what I was planning to say. And yes, to thank the officers for the comprehensive information. Um, so I will second that proposal. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions that members have before we come to a, a vote? OK, so the only the uh, only proposition we have that has been both proposed and seconded uh, I believe I'm right in saying is is the recommendation which was for refusal. Can I just confirm that with Mrs Nicholson just to make sure? Yes, Chairman. Thank you very much. So to for clarity, Mr Chairman, can can I just um so if the stock numbers were greater, would the would the flood risk still exist? That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. My my understanding, and I'll I'll stand to be corrected by Mrs. De Vries, is that the the flood risk won't change. But if you've got the stock numbers higher to a point where it justifies having a, an agricultural worker on site, then that would be a justification for allowing a, a potential development in the future. But it, it obviously has to meet that criteria in terms of of need. Mrs. De Vries, thank you. Um, I think minimizing it to stock numbers is is a little bit too simple an assessment because if if someone imported 150 cows I'm, I'm picking numbers out of the air which justified one standard working day great if they can't afford to pay for them as part of the business they haven't got anywhere to look after them as part of the um facilities they haven't got enough land to graze them on it's it's part of that whole picture that we need to look at so whilst increasing numbers does increase the man hours that you need to look after those numbers, you also need to be satisfied that you've got the space, you've got the facilities, you've got the amenities, and you've got the financial backing to sustain it. So yes, increasing stock will help with the hours. And if as a result of that and all the other factors, you could justify that you need one person on site 24 seven, then the flood risk element is sort of outweighed if you like because there is a locational need for you to be in that area of flood risk but if you don't meet that target then there's no requirement for you to be in a high area of flood risk so there's a there's a conflict with flood risk as well thank you for that dawn thank you so in effect it is a it's a, it's a two two layer thing of both financial and functional need that need to be proven yeah okay in which case then we have the recommendation that's before us for refusal proposed by count Councillor Glassford, second of a Councillor Pierce. So, if we start with, uh, should we start with Councillor Hendry this time? Okay, Mr. Chairman, I've seen and heard everything. A bit of a complicated one, this one, by sure. But yes, I'm, I'll go along with it and say for 
Thank you. That's for the refusal. Yes, it is. Yes, that's okay. it. Councillor Scott. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm afraid in this instance I'll have to go along with the um, officer's recommendation for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you. Yep, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I am for the recommendation to refuse. Thank you. I'm just wondering, did I, did I miss asking Councillor Scott about being present throughout the presentation? Yeah, Thank I think you did. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I should have said I've seen and heard the whole debate. Thank you. Thank you. Just after hearing Councillor Pearce say it, I thought I'd missed something. Um, Councillor Glassford. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate. I am for the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much. Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard all of the debate, and unfortunately, the functional need hasn't uh, for permanent work hasn't been met. And so, I am in favour of the officer's recommendation for refusal of this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I've seen and heard the debate, and um, I'm for refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I've seen and heard all the debate, and with regret, I am for the recommendation for refusal. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Bolt. Yes, I've been present throughout the uh, whole application debate, and I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. I've heard the whole debate, Mr. Chairman, and just to be awkward, I'm going to abstain. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've been present and I've heard the, the whole debate and I'm for the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I can confirm I've been present and heard the debate and the presentation and I'm against the proposal. Thank you. And Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have heard the and seen the whole presentation and I abstain. Thank you. And myself, I've been present and heard the whole debate and presentation, uh, and I'm also for the recommendation for refusal. So, Mrs. Nicholson, I think that's all members. If you could just confirm the the votes. Well, I'm going to go for <laughs> four in favour of the recommendation. Uh, sorry, let's try that one again. Eleven for the recommendation and two abstentions. I'm not so sure. I think there might have been an against in there. Do we, can we just have a check through the numbers? Chairman, can I tell you my result? Please do. One against, two abstentions, ten in favour of refusal. That's what I've got. So ten, one and two. Can I just confirm who was it against then? It was Councillor Evans. Okay. Can you just confirm Councillor Evans? Yeah. Is that correct? So Yes, that's correct. I've voted against the proposal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So that's 10 for refusal, one against, and two abstentions. So that is clearly carried. So permission is, is refused, but obviously the agent has heard the discussions about uh, possible ways forward. Right, members, if you go to your next application uh, on the agenda, which is on page 46, and we move to Wemden. Just going to leave, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Try and so, leave. <laughs> so, um, uh, Chairman, um, if I'm leaving, will there be um, more after this application? No, the, this application is, is the end. There's, there's no other presentations or information. So I don't, I don't need to come back then? If, no. if you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No. I'll say goodbye then. Thank you, Councillor <laughs> Kingham. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Right. <laughs> Members, if we move then on to, as I say, page 46 and Mr. Evans, could you uh, introduce this one, please? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this application is one that was deferred from our meeting two weeks ago uh, for the erection of a, uh, a extension to the rear of uh, two Lindhurst Crescent in Wemden. The reason the application was deferred was because of the need for a view from the neighbouring property. So if we just uh, re reacquaint ourselves with the site, this is the application site in Wemden here, part of a 
dense residential area in in the village, uh, mainly characterised by detached properties uh, within a linear fashion alongside the highway. Uh, the application site is outlined in red here, with the extension located on the back here. The proposal also includes the erection of a, a porch to the front and an extension of the existing dormer window to the front roof slope. So the application is the, the presentation will be slightly longer in the sense there'll be more photographs to show, but these will be taken from number two. Uh, Meadow Park, which uh, was a um, source of uh, debate last time. So these are the existing elevation drawings. Uh, so the, there's an existing first floor dormer window to the rear elevation of the existing property. This is the dormer window which is proposed to be extended with the existing porch replaced with a new porch at ground floor level on the front elevation here. So these are the proposed elevations. Uh, so the front elevation is located here, the south elevation. As you can see, the proposed dormer window would be extended to the side and a new pitch roof porch to the front. Those elements of the proposal have not been objected to by any statutory consultees or representations received. However, the contentious part of the application is this extension at the back, which has uh, ground floor accommodation and accommodation within the roof slope here. So effectively, the extension would be a large roof there, rising to the same height as the existing property. Uh, this is the footprint of the proposal here. And I've just indicated on the plan the distances between the existing, uh, the existing boundary and the proposed extension, as well as the distance between the existing property and the uh, existing boundary. Um, there's an existing garage here, which is to be retained. This belongs to the applicant with the adjoining house located on this side as well. Right, so this is the rear elevation as you can see it today. So you've got the flat roof dormer window within the existing rear roof slope. This existing conservatory will be replaced, uh, removed, and the extension will go along here projecting out into the rear garden towards the, where this photograph was taken. So this is two and four Meadow Park to the uh, east of the existing site. This is the shared boundary here. Um, and these are the closest properties uh, in respect of this direction. Um, and again, photographs were taken from that property, which we'll see in a bit. This is four Linters Crescent, which is to the west of the application site. This is the applicant's existing garage, um, and this will be retained with the extension located roughly where the, this photograph was taken from. Uh, again, another view of four Linters, Lindhurst Crescent to the west uh, with the existing garage behind this uh, bush here. Um, just give an idea a bit of context there. And this is a view from Lindhurst Crescent itself. Uh, so the two neighboring properties here, Meadow Park, and the extension will go in behind here. So effectively, what you'll see from this angle is a, a roof slope that will be sloping away. The highest point of the roof will be in the center of the existing roof um, and will slide down towards the eaves level on both sides of the existing property. So as you can see, there's this existing porch and dormer window. This will be extended. This will be replaced. It's not considered these elements have raised any concerns with regards to existing street seam. Um, you may see in the, the latter part of this presentation some more examples of the type of development that's gone on within Lenhurst Crescent uh, in terms of extending the roof and, and front elevations. So this is the first photograph of the view from Two Meadow Park. Um, so this is the, the neighboring property. Um, so you see four Lenhurst Crescent here, and the extension, which will be positioned in the center of the property, will come out here and down. So it will not extend beyond Lindhurst Crescent, for Lindhurst Crescent itself, but it will come uh, roughly about three quarters of the way back along the existing garage there. So in effect, what you'll see is the extension will block out the view of for Lindhurst Crescent, um, but in effect, it will come out slightly higher from this angle, but it will be the same height as the existing property. Uh, this is a view taken from a slightly different angle, but in the same location. This was taken in front of the neighbor's kitchen window. Um, as you can see, just on the right-hand side of the shot here is the conservatory. Um, but again, the, the extension will come out, and basically it will block the view of the side elevation of Fall into as present there. Um, it should be noted that obviously the, the amount of sky that you can see within this photograph in respect of where the extension will go is fairly minimal in terms of its... Uh, projecting out from the rear elevation of the property itself. This is another view. This is taken from the outside the living room area of Two Meadow Park. 
Um, so the extension itself will uh, have its roof go up, come out here, and then come down broadly in this location here. So extending beyond the existing conservatory you can see there. Um, but in effect, it will be a pitch, shallow pitched roof replacing this dormer window here. Uh, the only windows on the side elevation that face out onto the garden will be on the north elevation, which will face away from this direction. There will be two roof lights on either side of the property to, uh, extension to serve exist, uh, the proposed bathrooms, but these will be obscurely glazed and, and restricted in terms of their fitting to allow ventilation, but not necessarily a viewpoint out of. Uh, this is a view from the bottom of the garden of Two Meadow Park, looking back towards the application property here. So again, the extension will come out towards this direction here. Um, and this is a viewpoint of the existing garden of number two Meadow Park in the distance you can see. So this is a conservatory on the left-hand side here. Um, their existing garage as well, and the size of the garden in terms of detachment between the existing property, the proposed extension, um, and the neighboring property, which is located out of shot here. Uh, there was a comment last time about the viewpoint of the proposed extension from uh, Brantwood Road and Inwood Road. Uh, this is the application site here. So as you can see, the back boundary, the north boundary, is fairly well planted with trees and hedgerows uh, and shrubs. So the, the viewpoint of the site from these external public vantage points will be minimal, and it will not impact on the character of the surrounding area. Uh, this is another view taken from Meadow Park. So this is number two Meadow Park here, and this is number four on the left-hand side. Um, this is a viewpoint of where the extension will be. So this is number two Lindhurst Crescent with number four further beyond, and the extension will come out here again, just to give you an idea of the context of the surroundings and its, vis and its visual impacts. Uh, this is a view taken from Meadow Park further to the south. This is the application site here with number four Lindhurst Crescent located to, sorry, number four Lindhurst Crescent located just out of shot beyond two Lindhurst Crescent. And there you have number six, I believe, there where you can see a, a, another example of an extended dormer window to the front elevation of the building. Uh, this is a similar viewpoint, but from the junction of Meadow Park and Lindhurst Crescent. Again, it's just to give an idea of the impact, visual impact of the extension from uh, external vantage points. The extension will come out at the middle point, the center point of the roof, projecting out to the rear. And again, is not considered that there will be a significant visual impact from this extension, given its size and scale in relation to the existing property. This is a similar shot to one we saw earlier, but again, it's a bit more updated. This was taken uh, two weeks ago. And again, it just shows the site, its context, and its distance from the existing neighboring properties to the east of the site. Uh, this view is taken from Lynnhurst Crescent again, but is taken from an angle which is to the west of the site. So you have number four Lynnhurst Crescent here. The extension itself will project out from the rear elevation of this property of number two here. Um, there will be a glimpse of it through the gap between the applicant's property and the neighbor. But again, not significant enough to warrant a, a refusal in terms of its visual impact. And we end with the Google Street View again, which kind of reiterates what we've already seen from the other photographs but it does um, show the context of the site and the surrounding area. So the recommendation is still one of granting consent as it's considered the extension itself is of suitable design, uh, is of matching materials, will not affect the street scene or the surrounding area, and will comply with policy D2 in respect of design and scale. The proposal is also considered to have an acceptable impact on the residential amenity of nearby properties in respect of overshadowing and loss of light given the distance of the extension from those properties, the design of the shallow roof slope, and the lack of overlooking to existing gardens and, and direct overlooking to existing windows and uh, openings. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Uh, Councillor Glassford? Yes, I, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I did have a wander around uh, there yesterday in that, and um, looking at uh, the surrounding street scenes in that, this uh, is totally out of place with the rest of uh, the houses there. there was, as far as I was concerned, I do not see any other uh, sort of uh, additions to any of the other houses to this extent. And I think it will look totally out of place for the street scene in that. And I do not, I cannot support this because 
There's nothing else like it in in that road, anywhere close to that, and it's totally out of order. I cannot support this. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, very interesting to hear how different two weeks makes in a presentation. Um, this gentleman, I, I'm sorry, I do beg your pardon, I can't remember your name. The gentleman who made, Liam Evans, uh, Mr. Evans, very interesting presentation which seeks to more or less obscure the size of the, um, I don't mean that unprofessionally, but. I, I think Councillor Mur Murphy, again, if, 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 we, if you can focus on the, on the issues that you have in terms yeah, of the I have issues, Mr. Chairman, and I'll make them. That's um, fine. But, but we um, don't need to, to question the, the, the officers are trying to put the information in front of us. They're not trying to obscure anything. So Well, well I may, if I'd like to make a point here, uh, I noticed that the slide that you, Mr. Chairman, spoke about when this came up last time, the slide from, is it Lyndhurst Avenue? Lynnwood, where's, where are we? Where's the uh, Lyndhurst Crescent? There was a slide, uh, I can't remember, I think it was slide number 12, where the whole of the extension was put in. And you and I and others objected to that because the street scene was affected. I, the words I use was, it looked like a barn. It might have been a workshop. Um, it was, it's actually 26.6 feet long uh, and a total of 45 square meters. And from a previous, uh, a previous um, application that came before us this morning, um, I think uh, Mrs. Hobbs confirmed that 40 square meters was enough for a house. And when, can I, can I have a, may I have a look at the, um, the drawings of the, the first couple of drawings that you showed, Mr. Evans? Uh, the drawings, the actual site drawings, the layout of the house. Yes, the layout of the house. I have noticed that looking at the layout of the house, that this is, in my opinion, not an extension. It's a duplication of the floor plan of the house. And that was brought up the last time this came along. The actual floor plan of the house shows, I mean, a very, quite a substantial uh, kitchen, dining, uh, uh, an area for sitting, uh, as well as in the previous house, a lounge, um, a kitchen, etc., which they are now changing into an office. So in my opinion, this is, is not an extension. It's a duplication. It's almost like a semi-detached house being added onto the back of the other house. And it's made worse by the fact that it's two stories. We have seen other applications where an extension is an extension of the ground floor with a smaller upper, which does not impact on the neighbor. But this is it, it, the height of the house is at the eaves of the, almost at the eaves of the previous house, at the top of the roof. And looking at it with this 26.6 foot extension, I believe that is not acceptable. And I totally agree with, agree with Councillor Glassford. In that area, it is simply to, to put a thing as the size of that with the size of roof, it, the impact on the neighbours having a, almost a 27 foot extension out from one part of the building to the next, I believe is overbearing, overdevelopment. Certainly, it comes into, in my opinion, into the unneighbourly category as which you have in D25 promoting residential amenity. And I believe that we should refuse this application point blank. I mean, why on earth would you want to have the, the precedent set where anybody could come along and duplicate their house in size, both upstairs and downstairs? So I'm, I'll reserve uh, judgment to come back. But I noticed that Mr. Evans did not show the slide that you and I objected to. I'd like to reserve a further comment for later, Mr. Chairman, but that's what I'd like to start with. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bolt. Yeah, thank you. Um, if, if we could bear in mind the picture that's on our screen now, we're looking at the side view, which the, um, the photos will show in a moment. We're actually doubling the size uh, uh, from the side view. If we can now go to the picture that's just been taken from the back of the, the house that uh, Mr. Evans went to. Not not that back of that house, the, the uh, 
House on Meadow. Yep. Basically, it's the full width of the apex at the bottom coming out again, which is almost going to be the two fence panels and the roof line going across. If, if, if something is, <laughs> it is quite overbearing and the visual dominance is um, going to be too much. Um, uh, that's where I, 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 what I'm, you know, I can't agree with this, um, and personally, I'd like to move that um, we don't accept the officer's recommendation. Okay, Councillor Bartwall, I will just remind you, I'll come back to you in due course for you to just give us the, the, the planning reasons for that, so that would be fine. Yeah, that, sorry, that would be D25, um, overbearing visual dominance, and potentially the loss of daylight. Okay. Uh, Mrs De Vries? Um, mine was uh, originally just to come back on, on earlier comments by a member. Um, just in terms of the presentation, all the slides that were shown in the last presentation to members are have been presented as part of this application. Um, so we haven't not presented anything that we previously presented. Um, and the only additional information, obviously, is the information from the neighbouring garden, which was what was re requested. Um, just to come back on one point that was raised by one of the members in terms of the scale of the extension, um, it isn't um, a policy requirement for extensions to be subservient to the main dwelling now. Um, that doesn't always mean large extensions are appropriate, but if it is a large extension, what you have to look at is what the impacts of that extension is where you can see it from and who it impacts on and what the degree of impact is. So it's it's those questions that members need to be focusing on. The fact that it's almost doubling its footprint um, isn't, isn't a material consideration in its own right. And in terms of the block plan, which I think is slide four, Liam, um, the site still benefits in itself from quite a large garden. So there's no objection in principle to a large extension on the application site. The question for members will be what would be the impacts of such a large extension and whether they're happy that that's sort of contrary to policy if, if that's the way that they're going. But in terms of that slide, there is still quite a large rear amenity area. So um, in terms of size and scale, we wouldn't say it's overdevelopment of the plot per se, um, but you'd have to look at what the impacts of that size and scale would be and how, how you balance that against policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got councillors Perry, Glassford and Murphy. So, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I would like to second um, Councillor Bolt's um, request to refuse permission. It is definitely uh, overbearing um, and it's almost it's another house being built on the, to on the end of a, an existing building and um, it, it, it's too big. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Glassford. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I was going to second that motion. I do not like going against officers' advice, but uh, it's already been seconded. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. De Vries. Um, uh, thank you for confirming that all slides have been shown. Do you think I could see the slide that Councillor Filmer and myself actually saw from Lindhurst Garden with the with the uh, with the extension put into the house because I see you have one that doesn't have the extension shown. Uh, I assume it was an artist's impression, but it was something which we when we saw from the uh, the slide um, the slide that you confirmed has been shown again, but I haven't seen it, and uh, I wondered if uh, we could see it again. I think, Councillor Murphy, in terms of the one that had the artist impression uh, on the building, I think that was something that was circulated by an objector. Uh, I'm not sure that was part of the presentation last time. No, the, the, no it was the one that you and I both objected to. Yeah, the, it was, on. I certainly commented on one from the view from Lindhurst Crescent, which was, yeah. was one that didn't have the ad additional bit in. It did just show where it would be going. But um, if, if uh, Mr Evans, if you can go forward slightly on your presentations it was the view from Lindhurst Crescents uh, and there was a bush and there was a, there was a, there was the extension that, shown that's, yeah. that's the one that was in the presentation last time but but as yeah. I say I, I know that there has been an objector uh, that was sent round last time not this time showing uh, 
their version of what they thought it would would look like. The thing that really, really stuck in my mind when I listened very intently to Mrs. De Vries last time, I took down and listened to her saying the impact of this building is not insignificant. The impact of this building is not insignificant. In other words, it's significant. And I, I really stuck in my head this business of going through these planning things and listening intently. So I, I stick with my, my view, the same view as others, that this is definitely overdevelopment and almost doubling of a house. I still think it's too big. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Thank you. Are there any other comments from members that we have? I'd just like to come back to, to Councillor Bolt, if I might, in, in terms of uh, reasons for, for refusal. Just, I just want to get it clear so that everyone knows what, what they're voting on. Um, just one thing I was looking at was, in effect, the on page 50, there is a conclusion which is drawn, um, which then leads to the recommendation of grant permission. I'm just wondering, Councillor Bolt, in effect, are you... Are you in effect saying the negative of that conclusion that that the rear extension will not be in keeping with the character and appearance of the Dormer bungalow and that it will result in a significant impact on the amenity of adjacent properties through excessive overshadowing and visual domination? Councillor Bolt. Perfectly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Okay. I'm just... Thank you. And uh, uh, was it Councillor Perry who seconded? Is, is that what your view was? Yes, yes, I agree okay. with that. And Mrs De Vries, are you happy that that is a, a, a reasonable, um, no, it's a reasonable uh, argument for members to put forward that they disagree on those points and that that would be the reason for refusal? Yeah, so effectively we're taking the reverse opinion and looking at policy D2 and D25 of the local plan. Yeah, I think, to be honest, the only thing you'd, you'd probably have to take out of there would be the, the word overlooking, because there is no overlooking from that extension, because there's no w windows in the roof. But but other than that, if, if members are happy that that's the proposal that's before them. OK, if there's no further comments from members, I'm going to come to members in, in turn uh, to ask them both to confirm they've been present. <laughs> And, that ha and what their view is in terms of the recommendation for refusal. So if, if you are for refusal, obviously vote for. If you would, would wish to have seen this granted, you vote against. OK. If everyone's clear on that, we'll then take the vote. So if we start with, uh, let's start with Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I've seen and heard the, uh, the whole presentation, and I am... Um, uh, hold on a second. The, it, we, the, is, they're saying to grant. I am against. No, no. no the, the the recommendation has been moved. For. Is the no? The proposal is for refusal. Thank you very much. I am for refusal. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I can confirm that I saw and heard the whole presentation and the debate, and I am for refusal. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. Is Councillor Bradford there? I might myself somebody else interfere with me, I think. That's what happened. I've heard the whole debate, Mr Chairman, and, and I'm for refusal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Bolt? Yeah, present throughout the whole debate and application um, for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Perry? Yes, I was uh, listening to the debate. Uh, I heard everything, and I'm for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard everything, and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've heard and seen both debates, and unfortunately on this one, I'm, I'm going to abstain. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the debate. I am for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I am for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, I have seen and heard everything, and yes, I'm, I'm for the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I'm the last one, so I've also seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm also for the, the proposal for refusal. 
So, Mrs. Nicholson, I think that is all members have voted who are present. Can we just count the uh, the votes, please? Eleven four. One abstention. Uh, let me just. Ten four. I've only got ten four. Um, I've, I've got ten four, Chairman. <laughs> okay, uh, and I think it is ten four and one abstention because we've lost two, two councillors out of the room, haven't we, councillors uh, Scott and Kingham? That's correct. Okay, so you happy, Mr. Nicholson? It's ten none and one. Sorry, say that again. So ten were for the recommendation. No against and one abstain. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. Okay, that's that's fine. Thank you very much. That's clearly carried. So permission is is refused. Right, members. That brings us, I think, to the end of our uh, items for today. So thank you all very much for your contributions, and we will close the meeting.